Wait, 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 wait. Right. Last time on Shibuya's Scrambles, we got an ending, sort of. We actually, like, we, we have achieved end 01. And we're up to 46 bad endings, so we've done very well in that regard. We are now on 5 to 6. So, you know the drill trap. Choose your character. We no longer have access to Maria. Maria has reached end. Alright, Pajama Robbie said Mino first, so we're choosing Minori Kawa, because two of you fuckers chose a character who's not even available anymore. The TV news continued to report on how Mamoru Tanaka had been killed in the minivan explosion. What? What does this mean? Chiaki blinked in confusion. I mean, Hannah told us herself that the van explosion was her father committing suicide, didn't she? The only explanation I can think of, Minori Kawa replied, is that Hannah was lying. He scratched his head as he considered the situation. But why? Chiaki said. Ozu let out a snort. Well, it would seem Mr. Toyama had a lie in order to deceive us. What an upstanding individual, using his own daughter to buy himself some time. Minori Kawa wanted to yell at the guy, but he managed to hold his tongue. The important thing was that Toyama was still alive. And if he was still alive, then there was still a way to save Heaven Publishing. They'd get the current issue out on time, with a big scoop waiting in the wings for the issue after that. From there on out, it should be smooth sailing. Well, no matter, Ozu said. Seeing as Mr. Toyama isn't dead after all, we'll just wait here for him. He sat back down on the sofa. But Sagawa leaned threateningly towards Chiaki. Hey! He snarled. You sure you don't know where the guy's hiding out? I don't! Chiaki shot back. And even if I did, I'd never tell you. Say what now? He leaned in even closer just as she stood on her tiptoes in defiance, and their foreheads collided with a dull thud. Both reeled back, clutching their heads in their hands. Just calm down, Chiaki, Inori Kawa said as he began rooting through Toyama's desks. For now, I'm going to look for clues to where Toyama might have gone. <laughs> you just focus on working on your article. Oh? Ozu raised an eyebrow. Getting a cooperative all of a sudden, I see. I want to change up the plan for next month's issue, and I can't do that without the editor-in-chief's approval. What Minori Kawa was actually looking for, however, was a back issue of Four Star General Gossip. He was pretty sure the article on Osawa had been printed in the magazine's inaugural issue. If he could find that scandalous piece that the scientists had asked for, he'd also be able to get his big lead about the power balance of the world being at stake. And if he could get that, not only would next month's issue be a sure thing, it was a good bet that the sales figures would go through the roof. He found a file folder full of early material and quickly flipped through it. It didn't take him long to find the article. Floundering Okoshi Pharmaceutical arranges marriage of political convenience. The large headline practically jumped off the page. Norikawa quickly read over the story. The basic gist of it was this. The corporate director of Akoshi Pharmaceutical had sacrificed his daughter in order to keep a researcher named Kenji Osawa on board. The daughter, however, had previously been dating another man. That must be what Osawa wanted him to look into. The guy his wife had been dating before they were married. It should be easy enough to just ask whoever had written the article. Minori Kawa's gaze jumped to the end of the piece, looking for the writing credit. The piece had been written by Toyama himself. Hey, ain't you done yet? Sagawa yelled. Tell us where Toyama is already. Yeah, Minori Kawa thought. We're going to need to do something about these guys. I'm still looking into it, he said. Just hold on. He made a show of opening and closing various desk drawers. The drawers themselves were packed with a jumbled mess of electrical and gas bills, just like my drawers. Noodle house delivery menus and the like, definitely like my drawers. Look faster, Sagawa growled. <laughs> Make a choice, chat. 
do we butter the guy up, or do we actually get some noodles delivered? I want noodles right now. What time is it? 3 a.m. Can't get noodles delivered now. <laughs> Everyone wants the noodles delivered. Maybe he could mollify this guy by having some noodles delivered for dinner. Hey, you guys hungry? I was thinking of ordering some soba. Man, this ain't no time for that, Sagawa snarled. Besides, we just had some soba anyhow. And ugh, it was awful. Don't talk to me about noodles. Sagawa launched into a shadow boxing session, as if trying to punch out the provider of his disappointing soba. The guy clearly had zero capacity for sitting still. But Norikawa had found the back issue of the gossip he was looking for. He still needed Chiaki's article though, and she wasn't quite finished yet. He had to buy some more time. By the way, he said to Sagawa, are you familiar with SOS? SOS? The thug paused mid-jab. Yeah, SOS. I was planning on interviewing them later today. Here they're some pretty tough guys. Hmm. <laughs> Only one of them would be able to give me a fuck would probably be that Achiendo. Except as I hear it, he's left the gang. Aha, uh -huh, really now? Heard anything else interesting? Sounds like nowadays they're being run by some guy named Susumu. The name Susumu rung a bell. Those two young punks who've been arguing after the van explosion had mentioned him. Seems like SOS is in a pretty rough state since Archie left, though. Minorikawa didn't miss a beat. What do you mean, rough state? Back in the day, they were all goody two-shoes, never shake folks down or steal or any of that stuff. Guess their founder actually hated that sort of thing. But now that he's out, a lot of rough and tumble, hot-blooded types have been signing up with them. The smart move is not to get involved with SOS nowadays, really. Hard to find a scarier bunch around here, when there's a lot of them together. Mm-hmm. And their main hangout. That's at Inferno, yeah? Yeah, over in Urahara Juku. Known as Urahara for short, the area east of the Japan Rail Harajuku Station, around where Takashita Dori meets Meiji Dori. There are many small clothing and accessory stores here, set up in renovated houses. Most of these shops are on the cutting edge of youth fashion, offering quirky and unique means of personal expression. Man, you've been listening out on the streets. What gives? Ura Harajuku, huh? Minori Kawa smiled to himself. Inferno's location had practically fallen into his lap. Suddenly, Sagawa's eyes went wide. Aha! So that's where Toyama is! Wait, nah. No way a coward like him would go to a place like that. Chiaki looked up from her keyboard. Look, can you please shut up? No, you shut up! That's my phone. Minori Kawa pulled his cell out of his pocket. It was Toyama's name on the incoming call screen. Minori Kawa's heart skipped a beat. Toyama, where are you? He blurted out as he picked up. Chiaki, Ozu, and Sagawa turned to look at him as one. Well, um... What were you thinking, faking your death like that? Even if we could fill those pages and postpone repayment, all it would do is delay the inevitable. I'd still be up to my ears in debt. So I thought if I made it look like I was dead... Minori Kawa let out an exasperated sigh. Well, everyone already knows you're still alive, so your little attempt at subterfuge didn't even wind up buying you time. What? Toyama's hysterical squeak was painful to hear. Alright, listen up, Minori Kawa said. If it's the debt you're worried about, you'll be able to pay that back real soon. What do you mean? I've landed a huge scoop. You could do a print run of a million copies and still sell out if we can run it as an article. Toyama perked right up. Wait. You really mean it? I'll give you all the details. Just get your butt back here. But aren't those loan sharks there at the office right now? Fine, then I'll come to you. Tell me where you are. The two thugs crowded nearer, a predatory gleam in their eyes. And Minori Kawa had a flash of inspiration. Got it, he said quickly, before Toyama could respond. Niashita Park. I'm on my way now. Don't go anywhere. Ozu and Sagawa grinned at one another, then bolted out the door. 
Heh, <laughs> Minori Kawa said as their footsteps receded. Those guys took the bait. I sent them to Miyashita Park. He allowed himself a cocksure grin. Right then, so where are you really, Toyama? You, you imbecile! I am at Miyashita Park! What? Minori Kawa fought the urge to pull his hair out. What the hell are you doing someplace like that? Why the hell did you tell them Miyashita Park? I thought it would be a clever ruse. But it wasn't! This is no time to be fighting, Chiaki butted in. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Minori Kawa scowled. Anyway, Toyama, those guys are headed your way. We need you to get out of there and go someplace we can talk. I can meet you there. Right, okay. They needed some place safe and public where they could speak freely. Some place where the staff wouldn't be overly nosy. <laughs> do we choose the familiar cafe or do we go for the noodle house? <laughs> Fuckers all about the noodles, huh? Recalling the noodle house from the menu he'd seen earlier, he opted for that. Dogen Hut, huh? Toyama rumbled the words under his breath. What's the matter? Is there some problem with that? Ah, no, no. Alright, I'll meet you there. It's over in Dogenzaka. The address is on the menu. He hung up, and Minorikawa quickly gathered his belongings. Chiaki, how's that copy coming along? Um, well, almost done? Just a little more, I think. Alright, bring your computer and come with me. I'll read over what you've got so far. Minorikawa waited as Chiaki got ready to head to the cafe. We we we're heading to the noodle house, not the cafe. <laughs> as the two were heading out of the office, however, someone else opened the door. You've got 14 minutes and 57 seconds left to send to press. The writer submits to the editor. The editor submits to the designer. This is the next step in that whole handoff process. Naturally, being late for this causes quite a lot of trouble. 56, 55... Eh? A slender man with a gaudy necktie entered the room and sat down on the nearest desk, staring fixedly at his pocket watch. Minorikawa narrowed his eyes dubiously. Who the hell are you? Always make sure to show up 15 minutes ahead of the appointed time. That's just common decency. The man gave no indication he'd even heard Minorikawa's question. I suppose I can wait here, he continued. Just for another 14 minutes and 20 seconds. Uh, Mr. Mino? Is this guy talking about our submission? Chiaki stared doubtfully at the newcomer. Hey you, Minorikawa asked. Are you from the printer? But the man did not reply. Don't ignore me. Are you from the printer? Still, the man remained silent. Minorikawa was furious. Look, cut the crap, he roared. In response, the man quietly reached into his suit pocket and pulled out his business card. My name is not Hey You. Katayama... Something Ichiro. I can't read the first one. Koi, damn it. Close. He handed the card to Minori Kawa. It read Choni Pon Printing Company Limited. Sales Department Division 1. Koichiro Katayama. I'm Koichiro Katayama, newly assigned to Heaven Publishing. A pleasure to meet you. My predecessor is in the hospital due to a car accident. Sachio Usui, 39 years old, single. A longtime veteran at Cho Nippon Printing. Rather timid by nature, the strain of dealing with publishers makes him sick to his stomach. At around 1.10pm earlier today, while driving to meet with one of his clients, he had to swerve to avoid a young man and woman who darted into the street. He crashed into the car next to him and ended up at the hospital. <sighs> he should make a complete recovery in about two months. Well, what are you doing here, Katayama? Minori Kawa asked. I thought we had until 8 o'clock to complete proofreading. 8 o'clock? Surely you must be joking. 
Our company's proofing deadline is 5.30. Katayama stared fixedly back at Minori Kawa. Now that had to be a joke. I heard from the editor-in-chief that it was 8 o'clock. I take that to mean, then, that you don't have any copy for us. It's not that we don't have it, Minori Kawa said. It's just not finished yet. Just hold on until 8. Katayama raised an eyebrow. No, no, no. Publisher and printer need to work in concert. Perhaps my predecessor was the sort to delay the proofing deadline owing to your... circumstances here. But now I'm in charge, and I do not make exceptions. The proofing deadline is 5.30 sharp, and I intend to keep it that way. And while I've been having this discussion, you're down to 12 minutes and 32 seconds. Katayama held out his pocket watch as if to emphasize the point. That's ridiculous, Minori Kara exclaimed. Just who the hell do you think you are? You guys are going to be printing a paper that I wrote. Do you even know how lucky that makes you? So just wait, okay? Just give us... <laughs> Make your choice. A bit melty. Whatever. Okay, that's three bees. Just give us three more days. Try to find it in your heart to wait three more days. That's not happening. Kadayama didn't so much as bat an eyelash. You have ten minutes and forty six seconds left. You son of a bitch! Don't get all high and mighty just because you work for the printer. High and mighty? I'd say it's the people on the publishing side of the things that act high and mighty. Whatever high-minded claims you might make, without us, you'd have nothing to put on store shelves. Forgetting that and blithely ignoring your proofing deadline makes for more work on our end. Just what are you getting at, I wonder? Now it's ten minutes and twenty seconds. Norikawa ground his teeth so hard he could hear it. His usual tactics were useless here. Katayama was simply too unflappable to be browbeaten. If you back down now, though, it was game over. Ten minutes and seven seconds remaining. I realize there's little point, but I'll wait until the designated time. That's just common decency. Katayama's pet phrase. Thus far, he has said, that's just common decency, three times in this story. Always make sure to shot 15 minutes ahead of the appointed time. I realize there's little point, but I'll wait until the designated time. There was one more. Do you know when and where it was? I don't. Katayama's eyes were once again locked on his pocket watch. It was no use. Minorikawa couldn't find a way to talk this guy around. Um... Jackie held her hand up. May I say something? Isn't it also common decency not to break a promise once it's been made? If you're referring to the 8 o'clock deadline, I was not the one who promised that. Maybe not, but I believe your predecessor's responsibilities become your responsibilities. Karayama crossed his arms and gave her a bemused look. What's your name, miss? Chiaki, she said bashfully. Chiaki Isol. The printer's expression brightened visibly. Good. That timid hesitation of yours is just splendid. You have none of the arrogance so typical among publishers. Huh? Chiaki was taken rather aback. In deference to your polite demeanor, I shall wait until 7 o'clock. That is the latest I can possibly allow. All right! Minorikawa shouted, practically in Katayama's face. We agree to those terms. No, I, I wasn't talking to... But we've got terms of our own. Katayama reeled ever so slightly. I'm not certain you're in any position to set terms here. Just shut up and listen. From here on out, you're coming with us. What? Why? We're going to finish up our copy on site, then burn the data on the CD and hand it over to you there. That's why. Katayama let out a sigh of resignation. Oh, very well. I suppose I'd simply be waiting here anyway. Minorikawa pumped his fists in victory. Alright, Chiaki. Go and copy the DC. Excuse me. 
<laughs> this is what I get for trying to eat a mint at the same time. Go and copy the DTP data we've got so far onto your computer. Sure thing, Mr. Mino. Jackie quickly set about copying the data from the editing department's desktop. Okay, done. Then let's go! With the others in tow, Minori Kawa headed for the noodle house where Toyama would be waiting. The sober restaurant Dogen Hut was roughly halfway up Dogen Zaka. A long-standing noodle shop on Dogen Zaka. Two years ago, the owner passed away from illness. Now, the restaurant is run by his widow, Maki Yoneda, and her two part-timers, Masa from Midoriyama Academy and Mohinda, an Indian exchange student. Despite the sign billing the establishment as a soba restaurant, duck meat soba and chilled curry soba are the only two actual soba offerings, and the rest of the menu, for some reason, is all udon dishes. And in fact, both kinds of soba are terrible, though maybe the chilled curry soba would be okay if someone else were making it. Inside, they encountered the proprietress near the door. She held a massive cleaver for cutting soba noodles clutched in one hand. Toyama wasn't there. Excuse me, Minori Kawa said. Has a middle-aged man come by your shop? Name's Toyama. The proprietress let out a weary sigh. That guy, huh? You folks know him? Yes, that's right. Then I'm sorry. I didn't want to have to do this. It was all his fault, though. You reap what you sow. Minori Kawa didn't know what she was going on about, but suddenly he had a very, a, a very, bleh, but suddenly he had a very bad feeling. So then Toyama was here. He asked cautiously. Yes, he came by. Well, where is he now? Please tell me. No, I have no obligation to tell anything to friends of Toyama's. Evidently, there was some bad blood between Toyama and this woman. The real victim here is me. Her voice rose abruptly to a roar. Now listen up good to this old woman's story. I don't have time for this, Minori Kawa thought. He needed to find Toyama as soon as possible, but instead it looked like he'd be stuck hearing out this angry woman first. All right, we're listening. Tell us your story. It's a long one. The woman's mouth twisted up, and she licked her lips, leaning in to tell her tale. Long, long ago, when I was still in my twenties, I would often make deliveries to Heaven Publishing. They were some of my best customers. Back then we were so busy my employees practically worked themselves to death. You see, Dogen Hut had the finest sober in Japan, and our spokesmodel was considered one of the most beautiful girls in the world. Back when this woman was in her twenties, Heaven Publishing hadn't even existed yet, but Minori Kawa figured he'd better not correct her, that would probably just piss her off and make her stop entirely. He kept his mouth shut, and listened to her silly tale. But anyway, that's all in the past now. As time went on, we had a lot of delivery customers asking us to put their bills on their tab. So much so that it became a problem, and we changed our policy to disallow that sort of thing. But the fine folks of Heaven Publishing considered themselves an exception to that rule. And that put my part-timer Masa, who does the deliveries, in a bit of a bind. Okay. Oh, Masa's a student at Midoriyama Academy. A first year student at Midoriyama Academy. After getting indigestion from eating too much parfait at a fast food restaurant on Center Guy, he was there with his girlfriend to do a dry run for a competitive eating contest. He wound up going to the restroom 14 times in one hour. Unable to stand idly by, his girlfriend called an acquaintance of hers, the gluttonous Chiriko Osugi, for advice on improving Masa's intestinal fortitude. It turned out, however, that Chiriko was planning to compete in the same contest. Knowing that they were up against a monumental competition, the two continued with their training, wary of the battle to come. He took the day off to go on a date with his girlfriend. I hear they're planning to compete as a couple in some ice cream eating contest that's going to air on TV. So they were going to practice, so they were going to a practice run together today. Honestly, how ridiculous is that? Honestly, I couldn't care less about Masa one way or the other, Minori Kawa thought. This whole experience was turning into a real ordeal. So yes, we were in a real bind. I run a restaurant here, not a charity operation. 
I'd call and ask them to settle up, but they'd always insist, Oh, we don't have any money. And that's a lie. It's gotta be a lie. What else could it be? Otherwise, how could they keep making that magazine of theirs? That Celebrity Confidential or whatever the hell it is. Celebrity Confidential was a weekly tabloid put out by one of Heaven Publishing's competitors. Minori Carr was just going to have to let that egregious mix-up slide. And that's not all, the proprietor spat. Oh no, on top of that, their magazine's little gourmet gabs corner or whatever they call it ran a scathing review of us. After that, customers started keeping their distance, and I aged 20 years practically overnight. Gourmet Gabs was a column that ran in Celebrity Confidential. There was nothing of the sort in four-star general gossip. This woman had clearly gotten the two magazines mixed up somehow. Awful. Just awful, isn't it? All I wanted to do was make sober for people to enjoy. So to be treated like this... To be treated like this... The woman had started to sob. The cleaver began to waver in her trembling hand. But then, earlier today, these two Yakuza-looking fellows came by. Said they were looking for Tayama from Heaven Publishing. Guess they saw one of our menus at his office and figured he might have come by. She had to be talking about Ozu and Sagawa. They'd both been nearby when Minori Ka was rooting through the desk drawers. They must have spotted the menu then. I told them he wasn't here and hadn't ordered delivery in some time. So they said that if I happened to see him, to give them a call. Now, I was going to just turn them away. They looked like a pair of nasty loan sharks. Toyama would never be able to pay off his tab if they caught him. And so I told them as much. The proprietress lowered her voice before continuing. But they said they'd be most appreciative if I could let them know. Even offered to pay his tab for me if I did. And well, that pretty much settled it. So I let them give me their phone number. Minori Kawa's face went pale. This lady had been bribed by those two thugs? And so I guess she figured it out. A little earlier, Toyama dropped by, looking like he was trying to lie low. So it all came together. I snuck out back and gave those two a call. And so here we are. You guys were just a hair too late. Oh crap. Toyama had been carted off by the moneylenders. Minorikawa had to find him right away. Mr. Mino, Chiaki squeaked nervously. We have to hurry and go look for him. Yeah. Minorikawa and the others headed for the door. Wait! The voice sounded as if it had echoed up from the very depths of hell. Minorikawa and company stopped in their tracks. You think I can just let you go? The old woman began to stalk towards them. Those guys. They left without showing their appreciation or paying off that tab. They lied to me. And so just who's going to show me the appreciation I'm owed? Who's going to pay that tab? You're all in this together, trying to play me for a fool. But hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. The proprietress lifted her cleaver high. Her eyes smoldered with inhuman rage. A murderous aura surrounded her like a bonfire wind. Wait, Minorikawa cried. We're Toyama's... his friends? Then prepare yourselves. You'll repay his debt to me with your lives. The three companions stood paralyzed with horror, watching their bloody doom approach. The blade glimmered in the dimness as she swung it towards Minorikawa. Time for some fresh meat! Oh. Minorikawa, Chiaki, and Katayama screamed. Their cries echoing clear across Dogenzaka. It was no ordinary grudge that the proprietress of Dogen Hut held towards Toyama, as Minori Kara and the others found out firsthand, falling victim to her mighty cleaver. Yeah, this isn't the right place to have the meet up with Toyama. Seriously, who the heck decided this was a good idea? I got an achievement for that.
Why? What? The achievement I just got was view all the bad endings in the seven is in the five o'clock time block. Like that's that's the only one. That's that's the only bad ending in the block. There's only one. Oh. Well then, let's pick a different choice. Let's try the familiar cafe by the station. He quickly described the location. Okay, Toyama said. Café de Trek. Got it. Café de Trek. <laughs> yeah. I'll see you there. He hung up and Minorikawa quickly gathered his belongings. Right, let's skip ahead. Except let's not. Uh, don't fancy rereading this, so I won't. It's also not letting me skip ahead. Oh, no, there, now it is. They reached Kafilo Trek without incident, and Minorikawa promptly spotted the publisher. Over here, Toyama hissed, eyeing his surroundings with obvious unease. Hana sat by his side, sullenly sipping on some juice. The waitress came over as Minorikawa joined them. May I take your order? she asked. Water. Just water, sir? Fine, make it a double. Exasperated, the waitress headed back to the kitchen. Toyama looked over at Katayama. Who's this guy? I'm Koichiro Katayama, from Cho Nippon Printing. Katayama presented his business card. Toyama turned to Minorikawa with a quizzical look. What's someone from the printer doing with you? I'll explain later. There's no time for that right now. Minorikawa replied. First, I need you to answer some questions. Does the name Kenji Osawa ring any bells? Osawa? Toyama closed his eyes in thought. She does. She has a laptop cozy. He heads up a laboratory at Okoshi Pharmaceutical. You ran a piece on him in the first ever issue of Four Star General Gossip. Toyama's face lit up with recognition. Ah oh, yes, that political marriage piece. Yeah, that one. Do you remember the details from that article? Of course. Who do you think I am? Toyama puffed himself up proudly. I used to be local news copy editor for the Central Times. I've got the details for all the stuff I've never covered here in my head. I've ever covered here in my head. <laughs> in that case, do you know who Kenji Osawa's wife was dating before they got married? Toyama blinked his eyes vacantly. Hey, what's the matter? Minori Kara asked. This, uh... This is a pretty tough pop quiz you're giving me. Surprise, kids, it's time for a science quiz. What colorless, odorless gas? Gas. Lighter than air. Lighter than... Wait, what? Lighter than and air. Okay, that's not me reading badly, that's just proof. Lighter than air, and used for consumer municipal gas applications, is also known as marsh gas or swamp gas. Helium, ethylene, propane, or methane. Tune in next time for the answer. It's methane, innit? Cut the crap, man. You just said you have all the details inside your head. Oh, they're in there, all right. It's you, Thane. Dang! Oh, they're in there, all right. They're just not coming out. Minorikawa slumped. Mr. Toyama, please, whether or not you'll be able to pay off your debt depends on your memory here. 
Hearing this, Hannah cast a cold glare up at her father. All right, I can remember, or I can at least try. Tayama folded his arms and hummed to himself, his gaze turned inward. Hmm, so... I feel like it was a really common name. Sato, Chiaki chirped. Yamada, was it either of those? They're pretty common names. Tanak. But Tayama shook his head. Minorikawa offered a guess of his own. <laughs> Fuck you, chat. Endo. <gasps> we found the jump! Tayama furrowed his brow and muttered under his breath. Maybe the choice was actually good. Mm, no. That's not right. right now, I guess we can say Tanaka now? We can also say Nakamura. No, no, let's think, let's think about this. Think about names. What the fuck kind of name is Chiyo Tanda, by the way? Okay, fine, we got three for C. Tanaka! Mm, no, not that. It was something else. Just then, the television inside the cafe switched over to a news report on the Shibuya explosion. Is Chiyo Tanda like a real name? Like, I've never heard that. That seems like two names put together. The remains of the individual discovered within the minivan itself, who has since been identified as pharmaceutical company executive Mamoru Tanaka. Mamoru Tanaka? Toyama turned around to look at the TV. An image of the victim's face appeared on the screen. What? The publisher blurted, nearly falling out of his seat. That's it, it was him right there. Mamoru Tanaka. That's what I said, Tanaka. Toyama pointed excitedly at the TV screen. That's who Kenji Osawa's wife was dating before they got married, Mamoru Tanaka. Minori Kawa felt himself getting goosebumps. The victim of the terrorist bombing in Shibuya was also linked to the researcher who was key to a terrorist viral scare. His reporter's hunch was now a certainty. Right now, Shibuya was at the center of some massive conspiracy. This went far beyond even a major scoop. Mr. Toyama, we need to make sure that next month's issue hits shelves. Chiyo Tanda. Okay, okay, I guess that's a real name. Not that that surprises me that that's a real name, because you can do a lot of funny things with, with Japanese, but that can't be common. Then again, maybe it can be. What do I know? I'm certainly no expert. Minori Kawa called up Kenji Yosawa to let him know the results of his little investigation. The man didn't seem terribly surprised. Probably he had his suspicions all along. Yeah, maybe doing Minori Kawa first was actually a good idea. We found, like, two jumps. Osawa told him that there was something he needed to do before he was ready to give details on the big scoop, but that he would call back later. In the meantime, Minorikawa knew he'd have his hands full getting the current issue of the gossip wrapped up for the 7 o'clock deadline. He slapped his hands down on the table. Alright, emergency editing meeting, right here, he announced. We need to get a lead in on the Shibuya terrorist bombing into the next issue. The article about the twins winning the beauty contest can be dropped for that. We'll use the info from Kenji Osawa as the basis for our big scoop in the issue after that. Mr. Toyama, any problems with that? No, that should be fine. But what about the remaining pages for next month's issue? Benorikawa opened the file on his computer. The layout built in the DTP came up on the monitor. The report on the Burning Hammer sales demo. The surveillance camera opinion piece. The interview with Orai. Those three were finished, the copy already incorporated into the layout. 
once Chiaki Street interview piece was loaded in, that one could be checked off as well. Chiaki, how's your copy coming along? I'm sorry, I just need a little bit longer. The writing seemed to still be giving her a fair bit of trouble. The article on SOS was still just a placeholder in the layout. And Minorikawa hadn't even gotten any material for that, pushing it even further behind than Chiaki's street interviews. Still, he'd at least learn where Shibuya's legendary street gang made their hangout. He'd just have to take the risk of dropping in on them unannounced to ambush them with some interview questions. And then there was the lead-in for the Shibuya bombing. That wasn't even in the layout yet. It was a completely blank slate. Against all odds, they were going to need to put, put that article together from nothing with just an hour and change. It was an impossible amount of work for just him and Chiaki to do. Well, well, well. And how are things coming along? Katayama rose and came closer, trying to peer at the monitor. Minorikawa hurried to cover the screen. Don't look. If the printer rep saw all the blank pages, he might decide to stop waiting. Would you mind telling me roughly what percent of the total you have completed thus far? What percent? Come off it, man. We're at 100 percent. If you're 100% done, that implies that you're all finished. Can I please have the data then? No, no, I'm saying our willpower is at 100%. I'm not even going to pretend I understand what you mean by that. Shaking his head, Katayama sat back down in his chair. Norikawa, Toyama gasped, his expression uneasy. So I know I asked before, but why is someone from the printer here again? Katayama promptly chimed in in a cute circle in the corner of the screen. The long and short of it is that your proofing deadline has been changed to 7 o'clock, he said. What? But that's impossible! Who's doing the lead-in for the Shibuya bombing? Toyama eyed Minorikawa, and then Chiaki. Both stared back non-committedly. And it really is impossible. We'll never meet that deadline. We don't have enough people. No, we do have enough. Minorikawa thrust out his finger. Mr. Toyama, you're going to write that one, and handle the layout. What? Heaven Publishing is your company. Won't you step up in order to protect it? Toyama hung his head. Even if I headed to the scene right now, I'm sure the other outlets have already gotten their coverage. I wouldn't be able to find anything new to write about. And so you're just going to give up? A moment later, Toyama was on the floor, Minorikawa glaring down at him. You've always said you wanted to tell the world about the things the mass media can't or won't write about. So what the hell difference does it make if they've already gotten the sound bites thereafter? Minorikawa's face was raw with emotion. Don't you dare give up. Not that easily. Get your ass out there. Find something that only you can write about. Minorikawa... Toyama began to object, then he glanced over at Hana. There was an imploring look in her eyes as well. Clint. I get what you're saying, Toyama grumbled, but still, you're expecting a lot. But then, despite his words, he flashed a broad grin. Yeah. Minorikawa let out a quiet chuckle. And it's got you all fired up. Yeah, I'm fired up, alright. Toyama's face shone with a resolve Minorikawa hadn't seen in a long time. There we go. That's the Toyama I know. You know, I'm really sorry. Now I see the huge burden I put on you. But damn it, it's going to be alright. Getting to his feet, Toyama took his daughter by the hand and strode boldly out of the cafe, looking like a changed man. Minori Kawa watched him go, glad the dithering was over. Even if Toyama was still in his prime, he'd be cutting it close to do that article in an hour. But he would pull through somehow. When it came to taking care of Hana, the man would rise to the occasion again and again. Father and daughter disappeared into the crowd, hand in hand. Minori Kawa shook himself out of his reverie. All right, he cried. 
Despite the clear blue sky, an unexpected gust of wind blew across his cheek. Come on, guys, we gotta get going too. Things might look grim, but he wasn't going to give up until the bitter end. It was time to head to the SOS hangout, Inferno. The three ran long and hard after leaving the cafe. If the proofing deadline was 7 o'clock, then they needed to finish up with SOS by 6.30 at the latest. The gang's hangout was in Uraharajuku. Running all the way there on foot was going to eat into too much of their time. The traffic was at a near standstill for some reason, and there wasn't a taxi in sight. How long do you plan on running like this? Kadayama called out, panting. Just take a look at the road. With this traffic, there's no point in hailing a cab. Even Minori Carl was feeling the time pressure now. We're just gonna have to keep running until the road's clear. What? Kadayama wailed. Stop your whining. Just keep quiet and stick with me. He'd finally gotten Toyama to find his willpower again. Next month's issue would come out on time, and no way was some printer guy going to mess that up now. But the traffic showed no signs of abating. Catching a cab wasn't going to be an option. Fighting an ever louder echo of despair, Minorikawa kept up his desperate headlong rush. To rush into a situation recklessly or heedlessly, not quite the same as being a daredevil. Still, there were limits to how far the mind could push the body before exhaustion set in. Eek! Rip. Ow. That looks painful. Except it looks like ketchup, but still. Ouch. As they were running across the pedestrian overpass, Chieki slipped and took a nasty fall. She skinned her knee hard enough to draw blood. Hey you! Minorikawa snapped at Katayama. Don't just stand there. Hold the poor girl already. Katayama scurried over to Chiaki. I... I'm sorry, Mr. Mino. I... Chiaki's voice bubbled with suppressed tears. Maybe it was cruel to make her run with her computer all the way to Uraharajuku. But the copy for her interview still needed to be looked over. They couldn't just leave her here. Minorikawa hesitated undecided. Even at a full run, they wouldn't make it in time. And with traffic the way it was, there was nothing they could do. You know how... Katayama consulted his pocket watch. Exactly one hour remaining. Damn it, Minorikawa raged. What do we do? Relentlessly, the clock ticked on. You've already hit a to be continued. Uh, this, this, uh, I mean, given that this block apparently only has the one bad ending. Well then. Someone said Kano- Kenzie said Kano immediately. For being on the ball, you get... a story. A gunshot rang out from Tatano's gun. But it was a wild shot, fired reflexively as the weapon flew out of his hand. A figure had leapt from behind the water storage tank, kicking him in the arm that held the gun. Then, moving almost too fast for the eye to track, the newcomer delivered an elbow strike to Tatano's jaw. Kano didn't even have the chance to fire his gun. Before he could react, Maria's kidnapper was already laid out on the ground. Without so much as looking back, the girl bolted down the stairs. Maria! Kano shouted. He started to chase after her, but a bright glimmer in the corner of his eye stopped him in his tracks. The strange assailant had drawn a knife, and was preparing to slit the unconscious Tatano's throat. Kano quickly brought his gun back to bear. Stop right there! The knife stopped, mere millimeters from Tatano's neck. Kano was sure that if he hadn't intervened, the detective's throat would have been slit already. The knife reader pulled back the hood that was had been yeah, that had been concealing her face. You 
I know you, Kano said, shocked to see that he recognized the attacker. It was the girl who'd been knocked down by the minivan explosion. Why stop me? She asked, her tone ice cold. Weren't you just about to shoot him yourself? I don't have a reason to shoot him anymore. Not now that you've helped Maria escape. Please, put the knife away. Very well. Looks like he's not waking up for a while anyway. The girl withdrew the knife and rose to her feet. Why did you come to Maria's rescue? Because she's my friend, the girl said simply. She's been infected with a virus, Kano said. We have to get her to help as soon as possible. He headed for the stairs that Maria had scampered down. Not so fa uh, No so fast. <laughs> Bless. Not so fast. Don't move. The girl's sharp tone made Kano stop. What for? He demanded. I thought you wanted to help. I do want to help her, which is why I'm not letting the police get, her ha get their hands on her. The girl's voice was quiet, but hard as steel. The police are afraid of the Ur virus spreading, which is why they'll certainly place Maria under quarantine. If that happens, there won't be any way to save her. Just who in the world are you? Before I answer that, let's make a deal. Kano waited, non-committal. I have information relevant to this case, the girl continued. I want to make an exchange. Kano swallowed the lump in his throat. An exchange for what? Tell me where Hitomi Osawa is. Hitomi Osawa? Stanley had taken Hitomi into custody. Kano could probably get in touch and ask him where she was, but... Why do you want to know where Hitomi is? Do we have a deal or not? The girl looked like she was in no mood to argue. Still, if she knew about the Ua virus, she was probably telling the truth about having information. But it was a violation of police policy to leak information on any investigation to a third party. Besides, was it wise to trust this young woman without knowing who she was? Kano weighed his options for a moment before replying. But we can't bad end from any of this, apparently. But it seems so important. Everyone voted C. First, I need to know who you are. My name is Kanan. Kanan? <clears throat> Kano thought back to the grisly scene at the Foreign Syndicate's hideout. Did she do that? Kano was almost afraid to wonder. Telling streamer that there's only one bad end kind of changes things. Well, th that wasn't the chat that did that. The game did that. Like, it flashed an achievement as soon as I got the one bad ending. And it was like, it view all bad endings in the, in the five o'clock time block. Like, the game spoiled that one. Yeah, I don't think it's to this game's benefit to reveal the fact that there's only one bad ending in this block, but... <sighs> My reactions are no fun. Well, you're no fun. Fuck you. As if sensing his unease, Kanan spoke up, her voice low and calm. Once you hear what I have to say, I think you'll be more inclined to tell me where Hitomi is. There was still a, li bleh, there was still a lingering trace of adolescence in this strange girl's face. It was hard to believe someone so young could be a covert Middle Eastern operative. And yet Kano would see how quickly she'd been able to render Tatano unconscious. Alright then, guess I'll go first, Kanan began. There's someone out there trying to get their hands on the antiviral drug. My objective is to eliminate this person, and put a stop to their plan. Kano felt neither surprise nor horror at her use of the term eliminate. After all that had happened today, he realized his sensibilities had gone numb. This person you're after. You're talking about an arms dealer named Alfred, aren't you? Kanan nodded. The Ua virus has been weaponized and tested several times on the battlefield to great effect, she said. 
the antivirus would render this weapon wholly ineffective. Countries the world over are dying to get their hands on it. Then why did Alfred orchestrate this kidnapping? If the goal is to get the antivirus, why not just steal it from the laboratory? There was a lot about this kidnapping case that still didn't add up. Kano was sure Alfred's plan was hidden in those baffling details. Lab security at Okoshi Pharmaceutical is practically perfect. The place is under surveillance 24 hours a day, and getting to where the antiviral is stored requires bypassing three sophisticated electronic locks. Getting the antiviral out is impossible. Unexpectedly, a sly grin appeared on Kanan's face. If you were Alfred, how would you steal it? She asked. Huh? Kano was taken aback by the sudden question. He thought good and hard about how to answer. Hmm. C seems sensible. There is no majority here. If you can't sneak something out, maybe you could sneak something in? Kano hadn't had any particular flash of insight. He just figured the opposite of the obvious might be the answer. To his surprise, Kanan gave a nod. Very astute. Wait, really? Six days ago, Alfred injected Hitomi Osawa with the Ua virus. What? The tale had taken a sudden and very unexpected turn. For you, maybe. So it wasn't only Maria who had been infected, but Hitomi as well? And six days ago at that. Wait, hold on. Hitomi Osawa was perfectly healthy earlier today. So that must mean. Exactly. Kenji Osawa administered the antiviral to her. An unsettling thought occurred to Kano. It was supposedly impossible for Osawa to access the antiviral law by himself. But if he'd been able to give it to his daughter all the same, then that had to mean... He needed Mamoru Tanaka's help to do it, of course. Which is why Alfred bribed Tanaka ahead of time. So that's what happened. Tanaka had been paid off to inject Hitomi with the virus. Getting Osawa to take action at that point wouldn't have been difficult. But why go to such lengths to get the antiviral administered to Hitomi? Why would Alfred have Hitomi infected with the virus only to then have her father cure it? It's been roughly a week since she was given the antiviral. The DDS is still in her body. The what? Essentially, taking blood from Hitomi Osawa now would allow someone to extract minuscule amounts of the antiviral. Kano was stunned. Suddenly, all these seemingly unrelated threads were beginning to form a pattern. So, since getting the antiviral itself out of the lab wasn't an option, Alpha must have thought of using a human vessel, he murmured. Which means the thing that Alpha's really after is... Kanan nodded. Yes, it's homie's blood, she finished. Alfred specifically requested the Hitomi make the ransom handoff, Kanan said. Additionally, the crime syndicate was hired to carry out a relay with the attaché case containing the ransom money. This would disrupt the investigation and distract the police, allowing the kidnappers to target Hitomi in secret. Wait, no, hold on. There was something about the story that still made no sense to Kano. Tell me this, he said to Kanan. All very valid questions. Well, no, we know the answer to A.
Why not use Tanaka for the vessel instead of Hitomi? Tanaka could enter the lab along with Osawa, then secretly inject himself with the antiviral. It didn't seem like that would be terribly difficult. A good question. If getting the antiviral were the only goal, that would be the most expedient means of doing it. So then why use Hitomi Osawa? Kano asked. Kanan thought for a moment before answering. Tanaka may have objected to the idea of giving himself the drug. I hear that it can have some severe side effects. But she seemed unconvinced by her own words. Do you know why they targeted Hitomi? Kano demanded. I don't. But I'm sure there must be some reason. Alfred hadn't gone with using Tanaka, which would have been the sure thing. Instead, they'd gone with Hitomi. Hitomi was injected with the virus, brought into the lab, and used to sneak the antiviral out. Now the plan was to extract the antiviral from Hitomi's blood. Hmm. Something about this idea still struck Kano as incredibly odd. So wait, why not just abduct Hitomi from the very beginning? Why kidnap Maria instead? <laughs> These are all the same. Surely they couldn't have been so foolish as to abduct the wrong target. So kidnapping Maria must have been intentional. But it didn't add up. No matter how he looked at it, Kano couldn't see any reason to kidnap Itomi's sister. It's... it's my fault that Maria was kidnapped. Kanan looked away. I contacted her before this all started. I told her about the kidnapping plan. And I gave her a GPS beacon to give to her sister, so that I could track Itomi's location after she was abducted. But my plan backfired. Maria switched places with Hitomi, and let herself get taken by Alfred. What the hell? Why hadn't Maria taken this to the police? Or if she was so determined to protect her sister, why not just get her to leave town or something like that? There must have been some sort of accident, though, Kanan continued. The GPS was never turned on after the kidnapping, and I wasn't able to track Maria down. But there was something that even Alfred hadn't counted on. Kanan cast a glance over at Tatano. This person right here, she said. So Tatano had disrupted Alfred's plan by going after Hitomi himself. Considering where it's all led, Kanan continued, Alfred must be panicking about now. But we can't let down our guard. Even now, I'm sure the Mastermind is thinking of some way to fit what this man has done into the Master Plan. So it's a perfectly imperfect plan, is that what you're saying? Precisely. Kanan flashed Kano an approving grin. I heard that from Stanley, Kano said, the man who drove you to the hospital earlier. That case officer, huh? Case officer? So that was it. Stanley was CIA. The US Embassy in Akasaka functions as the headquarters for the CIA Japan's branch. As the embassy building is not reliably secure, however, the agency carries out many of its activities in specially constructed embassy annex facilities, often under the guise of cultural exchange organizations. There are reportedly over 100 CIA personnel active in Japan, but given the inherent secrecy involved, the exact number is not officially known. Now that Kano thought about it, it all made sense. Since Alfred is an arms dealer with worldwide connections, I don't know what nation might be trying to obtain the antiviral. Obviously, any country that has the viral weapon would want to prevent their enemies from obtaining it. It's no huge surprise that people are butting in trying to put a stop to Alfred's plan. A tiny beeping sound caught Kano's attention. Kanan pulled a PDA from her breast pocket. Personal digital assistant refers to various types of small portable devices for information management, occasionally also referred to as a handheld PC. Interesting. The GPS I gave to Maria has just been powered on. Now I can find her location. Where is she? She's on the move. But why is the GPS suddenly active now? Kanan frowned. At any rate, I've told you what I know. Now tell me where Hitomi is. All right. Kano got out his phone and called Stanley. I disagree. 
dumb pie. Thank you for disagreeing for three months. I've run out of water. The American was quick to pick up. What's going on? Where's Hitomi? We're on our way to Endo Electronics in Dogenzaka. Endo Electronics? Why are you going there? Kano was familiar with the dilapidated old storefront. He had passed by the place countless times. Too long of a story. There's a lot that's happened. How are things on your end? About as bad as they could be, but I'm getting closer to the truth. Please, make sure you keep Hitomi safe. Alfred is after her blood. Her blood? Kano told Stanley what he'd heard from Kanan. I see. So that's what's going on. Once we're finished with things in Dogenzaka, I'll bring Hitomi right back to the precinct. Where is she? Kanan asked as soon as Kano had hung up. She's on her way to an electronics store in Dogenzaka. I see. Kanan checked Maria's location on her PDA. First, I need to get Maria, she said. I'll get to Hitomi after that. I'm going with you. Be my guest. With that, Kanan was off and running. Kano took one last glance at the unconscious Tatano, then hurried after Kanan as fast as he could. They ran from South Hill and Nan Dai towards Shibuya Station. As they darted and weaved madly through the narrow side streets, Kanan took an occasional glimpse at her PDA. It felt to Kano like they must be taking the shortest possible route to Maria's location. He stayed quiet, keeping pace as Kanan led the way. Before he knew it, they were heading up Dogenzaka. In not too long, they'd be at Endo Electronics. Hey, Kano called up to Kanan. What? She shouted back without turning. Are you sure this is the right area? Are you doubting the GPS? Now seems like a good time to make a restart. One B and an A. I'll go with B because Kenzie posted first. Actually, can I see that GPS unit? Kano peered over Kanan's shoulder and saw that the GPS was indeed pointing in the direction they were headed. They weren't just running around at random, nor was the unit broken. Huh, and their electronics is right up ahead, he said. What? Kanan stopped abruptly. What are you suggesting? The twins are heading for the same location, that's my guess. Still, what did that actually mean? Kano hadn't figured that out yet. They took off running again, and before long, End of Electronics came into view. Kanan stopped in front of the shop door. Right here, she said, glancing again at her GPS. I knew it, Kano thought. Endo Electronics, the same place Hitomi was headed. Guess we're all winding up together, Kanan said. Or else we've been brought together. She peered keenly at the building and its surroundings. Kano swallowed hard. We? You think you've been roped into this too? Quite possibly. Kanan flashed a winning smile, then started to head into the shop. Hold on, I need to report into HQ. Kano hurriedly called Kuze on his cell. Kano, what's going on? I've located Maria Osawa. Huh? Was that? Kuze's words came out as a surprised and childish yelp. Come on, Kanan's smile turned into a steely glare. Time is critical. He nodded silently back at her. Kano, what's the location? Kuze asked. Where are you? I can't say right now, sir. Please, just leave this to me. 
Hey, now just hold on. But Kano ignored the director squawking and hung up. <sighs> Kanan had already entered the shop. She seemed wholly unconcerned by the idea that she might be playing right into Alfred's hands. Despite her youth, she clearly thought of herself as quite capable. Warily, he followed after her. After navigating a veritable cavern of junk, they came to a door that led to the living area beyond. Kanan quietly opened the door and immediately stepped inside. The home was divided into a dwelling area and a workroom. A man's voice could be overheard from the workroom, raised in anger. Don't you want to save Suzune? Kano and Kanan crept closer. Peering through the next doorway, they saw a tense confrontation in progress. Maria and Stanley were standing there, looking down at a middle-aged man who had restrained Hitomi with a stun gun pressed to her, her throat. Dad, of course I want to help Suzune. A young man stepped into view, speaking to the older fellow. But do you think this is what she'd want you to do? Kano watched intently, tensing for action. There was so much at risk here. He was about to barge into the workroom when Kanan grabbed him by the shoulder. Let's wait and see how this goes first, she whispered. He realized this was good advice. If they provoked the, the older man, things could very well take a sharp turn for the worse. They just have to hope the young man could talk him down. Yeah, but no. <laughs> Destroyed! Bollocks. Now what? Achiro Sawa, people. First post, best post. The rain won't let up. The sound is growing louder and louder inside my head. It is the sound of regret spattering against my heart. My emotions surge like a terrible storm within me. I never wished for this. Never expected my heart to be dragged so far beyond my control. We can't save Maria. We can't save Maria. We can't save Maria. The words stormed through Osawa's mind in a relentless cacophony. He called up images of the bodies from the human testing trials on his computer monitor. Music, once again, gets much louder. He couldn't help but imagine his daughter in the same gruesome state. In just a few more hours, Maria would begin hemorrhaging blood and die, just like the people in these pictures had. We can't save Maria. We can't save Maria. We can't save Maria. He couldn't shake the words, or the reality, from his mind. Damn it! Damn it! Damn it! Osar began pounding his fists fiercely on the desktop. Sir, what are you doing? Kajiwara tried to intervene, but he kept on pounding away. When he finally ceased, the pain of the repeated impacts lingered in his hands. My research was never about any sincere desire to help people, and now I'm paying the price for that. For one time it finally matters, I can't even save my own daughter. Mr. Osawa, Kajiwara set a hand on his shoulder. You can always blame yourself later, but for now, think again, good and hard. Is there really no other way to save Maria? Nothing else we could try? Osawa shook his head. 
The only means we had left was using Tanaka's password to unlock the doors. And now Tanaka is dead. There's no other way. Is there a possibility that Mr. Tanaka told someone else his password? This was something Osawa hadn't considered. Was there anyone Tanaka might have shared his password with? Only one person came to mind. Well, yes, there may be someone. You're referring to I, sir? Kajiwara cast his eyes down. You figured that out, then. Yes, back during the commotion over that listening device. A necktie clip isn't typically the sort of present one gives to one's husband's co-worker. And yet, although some might consider it somewhat, uh, inappropriate, Mr. Tanaka was wearing it as if it were a matter of course. Which, uh, implies something about their relationship. Kajiwara's voice trailed off. He coughed apologetically and tried again. I realize it's an awkward situation, sir, but please check with your wife. Even if I does happen to know the password, that does us no good if Maria gets quarantined someplace we can't reach her. I understand, Mr. Osawa. I'll bring Maria to you then. I'll do everything in my power to make that happen. The detective then produced a bunch of bananas from his pocket. These are all left over. You're more than welcome to them, sir. Despite his gentle smile, the rest of his face was firm with resolve. You said you didn't care whether other people understood you, didn't you, Mr. Osawa? Osawa nodded guardedly. At the risk of being presumptuous, sir, I understand you, Kajiwara said. I used to be quite the workaholic myself. You're just like me, innocent and awkward. On another occasion, Kajiwara was shocked to run into a man who looked just like him. The fellow was a stylist at a hair salon Kajiwara visits on occasion. He let out a gasp of surprise of his own upon seeing the detective. Kajiwara felt a peculiar connection and was expecting... what? Well, and was expecting to go to the salon regularly, but when the stylist asked what he did for a living, and Kajiwara answered honestly that he was a detective, the other man's face went pale and he bolted out of the building. Kajiwara never saw the man again after that. But that's another story for another time. Calling yourself innocent, huh? How modest of you. Osawa let out a sardonic chuckle, and after a moment, Kajiwara joined in. The next time I see you, Mr. Osawa, I'll have Maria with me. The detective gave a slight bow, then left the study, a look of determination on his face. Osawa watched him go with admiration. No matter what trouble arose, the man always looked for something he could do. He really was a fellow who knew how to hang tough. Compared to that... I'm just... Osawa couldn't even articulate his own self-disgust. And asking Ai about the password would also mean inquiring into her relationship with Tanaka. The prospect was daunting. Venturing into the emotional territory of another person was his weakest suit. He left his study, but somehow found himself making his way to Maria's room, not Ai's. He realized that he hadn't been into his daughter's room since a certain rainy day years before. Now he stepped quietly inside and saw Maria's world laid out before him. I get the impression Zoku might just have played Machi. A small photo was set atop her neat and tidy desk. It was a close-up of someone's hands doing a cat's cradle. Whose hands were they? From the skin tone, they didn't appear to be Maria's. No? Okay, well, Machi, can you, like, can Zoku, can you play Machi and then, like, like translate all of it for us? Just, just, just do that for us real quick, okay? Okay, thank you. Several more photographs were pinned to a corkboard that hung on the wall. They were snapshots of people and townscapes from the Middle East. One glance at them and Osawa felt like he was back there for a moment. 
The images weren't necessarily aesthetically pleasing, but they all looked like they'd been taken by a professional. When he spotted the last photo on the corkboard, however, he was certain that Maria had taken them all. The last picture was of Osawa himself. He was facing the camera, holding some luggage and flashing an awkward smile. It was a comical, affectionate image. I don't know how to dump the text from Machi, but what I can do, right, is I can go through and painstakingly rewrite all- like, write all of it into a notepad file. If I- if I, you know, if- if I had, like, several hundred hours to spare. He'd never Hi, known it to say- <laughs> Ran, thank you very much for the five months you interrupted. My reading, you cheeky bitch. Thank you very much. He'd never known that photography was one of his daughter's hobbies. No, this went beyond a mere hobby. Did she perhaps aspire to be a professional photographer one day? She certainly had the aptitude for it from the look of things. Maria, a photographer. As he mulled the idea over, Osawa felt his chest tighten. Right now, it looked like Maria's hopes and dreams were about to be snuffed out. Her future consisted of bleeding to death a few short hours from now. Osawa stared vacantly out the window. The view from Maria's room remained unchanged from so long ago. Again, that rainy day crept back into his mind, as vivid as the present. Imabiki Soul is a game that they've also got, like, plastered all over the walls in advertisements on this game. I'm gonna assume from the naming scheme it's in the same sort of series as Otorigi Soul. Otorigi Soul. Mm. Is, that, is that how you say it again? I don't remember. I probably said that wrong. On that day, Osawa was dealing with some pressing business from work. Otogiriso. There we go. No, Otorikiso. I'm mostly wrong. <laughs> He'd ensconced himself in his study, wrestling with some paperwork when Hitomi barged in looking distraught. Maria's gone. Sensing that Hitomi was legitimately alarmed, Osawa hurried to Maria's room. He found the letter she'd left atop her writing desk. Dad, you only care about Hitomi. You're always working and never do anything with me, so I'm running away. A few hours earlier, he'd cancelled their weekend trip to the amusement park. He just wasn't going to be able to get his work done in time. Hitomi had resigned herself readily enough, but Maria just couldn't accept it. She'd been looking forward to it for so long, she railed at him. How many times now had he broken one of his promises to her? Hitomi understands why we can't go, so why can't you do the same? The cold rebuke had ended her complaining, but it was clear she still didn't accept the situation. Now Hitomi helped him look around, but they found nothing missing from Maria's room. Despite her assertion that she was running away then, it seemed like there was no point in being overly concerned. Maybe she's at the park she always goes to? Hitomi looked worried. The park was roughly a 25 minute walk from the house. It would only take about an hour for Osawa to go get her and bring her home. But an hour was more than he could afford to spare right now. Dad, I think she's waiting for you to go after her. Osawa didn't need Hitomi to tell him that. He knew it well enough. That was what galled him so much about the situation. Why did she have to pull something like this, precisely when his work was at its busiest? He'd done everything he could as a father since his wife had passed away. Why couldn't his daughter see that? It's alright. Your sister will come back. The rain was coming down pretty hard outside the window. Do, do you think she brought an umbrella? Hitomi asked anxiously. I don't know, but with the rain like this, she'll come back home soon enough. He spoke the words for himself as much as for Itami. Then he headed back to his study and got back to work.
but several hours went by, and still Maria did not return. The rain had gotten even more intense, to the point where Osawa could hear it in his study. He was so concerned about his missing girl, that he couldn't focus on his work, but he stubbornly refused to give in and go search for her. Several more hours passed. At last, Maria appeared at the front door, soaking wet. Osawa met her silently in the entryway. Wet strands of hair clung to the girl's forehead as she looked up at her father with a bitter glare. You don't care what happens to me, do you? Immediately, Osawa smacked her across the cheek with the flat of his hand. It was the first time in his life he'd ever struck sunny anyone. He hadn't known such a violent impulse could exist inside him. Maria stood there, her hand pressed to her cheek. Tears welled up in her eyes. She began to tremble. On her lip was a small bead of blood. A flood of guilt and regret rose up inside Osawa, as if he just shattered some intricate piece of glasswork. How? How could I do such a thing? He clenched his shameful hand into a fist, and in that moment, he was afraid of Maria. Afraid that his daughter could bring such raw emotion out of him and make him do something so thoughtless. But even more, he was afraid of how stunted he was as a human being. Was someone like him really fit to be a parent? What kind of future could Maria and Hitomi hope for with a father like him? That was why he'd married Ai, as Makino had proposed. Having a mother, he decided, would help keep his family together despite their sad excuse for a father. But in so doing, Asawa had dug a psychological ditch between himself and his daughters. A deep ditch, so that he could keep his daughters from being hurt. So that he wouldn't hurt himself. Naosa was staring across that ditch, wondering if it was too wide to leap. He thought back to his earlier exchange with Kajiwara. If you get angry, you show it. If you get sad, you show it. It's human nature to let other people know how we're feeling, after all. But what if doing that hurts the other person? That's when you apologize, sir. Yes, that was right. He needed to apologize to Maria for what he'd done that day. It still wasn't too late. It's never too late. When it comes to family, there's no such thing as game over. He recalled Pretty Honey's words. He needed to apologize to Maria, and so he needed to ask I for that password. Everything I needed to know about raising a family I learned from the forums. Osawa was going to have to face his wife. Slow paced, keep out. Slow. You really gotta like how they have like different keep out animations for the mood. Like it's never the same animation. Like you've got a slow one where the, the melancholy thing keeps playing. Uh, you got, like, a big impactful one when it, like, there's an action scene, and you have, like, a foreboding one. Alright, alright, fine, oh, fucking god, you guys are so bitchy with me. Like, oh, go do the, the keep out immediately. Oh. Is this the one? Found it, guys, I win. I need a piss, though, so I'll be back in, like, two seconds.
Osawa's phone rang and Minorikawa's phone number popped up on the LCD display. The reporter must have finished looking into the matter Osawa had asked about. Mr. Osawa? Sorry to keep you waiting. How did it go? Well, I looked into the background of that story you asked about, and I learned who it was your wife was dating. Who was it? Osawa asked immediately. There was a brief pause. Mamoru Tanaka. I see. Finally, he had proof positive of a relationship between I and Tanaka. Now more than ever, it was no time to waver. No matter how painful the reality was, it was also true that if they hadn't been dating, there would probably be no way of saving Maria. So, Minorikawa said, what was this big thing about disrupting the power balance of the world all about? There's something I need to take care of on my end first. Once I'm finished, I'll tell you everything. Yeah, that's fine. Things are pretty hectic on my end right now anyway. Osawa had expected Minorikawa to put up more of a fight. He'd figured a reporter for four-star general gossip would be a bit more persistent. Oh, by the way, there was one other thing I wanted to tell you, Mr. Osawa. Osawa could practically sense the finger pointing his way from the other end of the line. Don't be too angry with your wife. All too often in this world, people let their anger get in the way of solving their problems. You may have a point. Osawa let out a wry chuckle. All right then, I'll call you back later. Osawa found Ai standing by herself in the yard as she kept her back. T- she kept her back to him as he approached. May I have a moment? He asked quietly. What? Still, she didn't bother to turn around. There's something important I need to talk to you about. I'm not in the mood right now. Please, Ai. I realize you're upset about Tanaka's death, but... At the mention of Tanaka's name, I slowly shook her head. Don't. Just tell me what you want. Hurry up and get to the point. Osawa tried to move closer to her, but she pointedly kept her distance. Uh, Let's get a think. Three A's, two B's, and one M. The A's have it. This was no time to mince words. Did Tanaka give you his password? His password? For the electronic lock on the lab. I needed in order to get the antiviral out. I turned to face him at last. To get it out? What are you thinking? That belongs to the company. I just need one dose to save Maria. Please, if you know, please tell me. I don't know it. Ai's voice was barely a whisper. Osawa looked his wife right in the eye. You're telling the truth. I am. I see. Then, do you have any idea what number he might have used for a password? Ai shook her head silently then turned her back to her husband once more. Even if I did know, she said, I wouldn't tell you. Why not? Don't you get it? Ai's words came out as a strangled rasp. Do you even know why I'm with you? She snapped. You really have no idea how much you're worth, do you? The value of one woman's life versus the potential profits your research would bring in. There's no comparing the two. If it meant that Okoshi Pharmaceutical could monopolize your talents, then what did it even matter than what I wanted for myself? There was something akin to desperation in Ai's words. And so you sent me those threatening emails, too. What? Ai looked at him in shock. He knew he'd guessed correctly. You would go that far. Just to keep me tied to your father's business? That's right. I would. I bit down on her lip hard. But what would you even know about how I feel? I'm sorry, don't apologize. I'm not the victim here. You say that, but isn't it because of me that you and Tanaka weren't able to stay together? I began to tremble. Her secret was out. 
When did you figure it out? She asked. Earlier today. That tie clip. <laughs> right. Not the sort of gift one gives to a husband's co-worker, is it? I's smile was bitter with self-deprecation. Osawa couldn't help pity her. Even Tanaka must have suspected that she'd placed the company's profit above all else, if she'd go to such lengths to protect it. It was like she'd given up her entire life just for that. Please, don't mess with my life up. Don't mess my life up any more than you already have. Ai's words were only a faint murmur, but Osawa felt the rejection they carried with agonizing clarity. Tanaka hadn't given Ai his password. Osawa's last chance had gone up in smoke. He let out a long, shaky breath and shut his eyes tight. Was it true? Was there nothing more he could do? The password. 428. I don't think we found the other one. No, I think we're kind of... I think we've only got one option here. I actually told Stanley and Hitomi what his father had done. As she listened, Hitomi hung her head. Her face was sallow. I'm so sorry, Achi told her. I'm not really sure what to say. He clenched his fist so hard his knuckles popped. Struggling to keep his emotions in check. So if I were rendered brain dead, you could help your sister, Hitomi murmured. A state where brain function has seized irreversibly. In Japan, there are two conditions for declaring breath death. Breath death? The first is that the patient must be comatose and in a state of apnea, no longer breathing, due to damage to the brain. The second is that the root cause is diagnosed and is deemed that no reasonable treatment will restore brain function. Stop, Nachi said quickly. Please, don't say things like that. A sad look came to Hitomi's face and she pressed her right hand to her heart. I mean, to find out like this... She turned to Achi, tears glistening in her eyes. I want to help your sister, but... We have other things to worry about right now. This time it was Stanley who cut her off. Remember, Alfred is after you, Hitomi. Isn't that what Kanan told you? Yes, she said I was the mastermind's target. Hitomi wiped away her tears with her fingertips. So Alfred and Achi's father are after the same thing. Is that just a coincidence? It didn't sound like he thought so. Hold up, Achi growled, leaning in from the back seat. Yeah, my dad's way out of line, but he did what he did for Suzune. He wouldn't work with terrorists. I'm not saying he's deliberately aiding terrorists, Stanley replied coolly. It's common sense that a pro wouldn't get an amateur involved with their plans. That makes it too likely that a clumsy misstep will cause things to fall apart. But then again, that's not the way Alfred thinks. So actually, the likelihood of failure could well be part of the plan. I actually thought back to what Kanan had said earlier. If you achieve your goals using accidental means, the outline becomes blurred, and it makes it harder for anyone outside looking in to grasp what the actual plan is. Hey, Buzz. <laughs> Not only have they put together a perfect plan, they've purposely left certain tiny holes in it. So if we assume the plan has failed, this slip-up might be exactly what Alfred wants, Stanley muttered. Sort of an intentional hole then, Hachi said. Stanley snorted. Kanan told you guys that too, huh? 
If that's the case, then you really are a fool. What did you just call me? Actually barked. If you've known all along how formidable this opponent is, you should have given Hitomi over to police custody right away. It's only a matter of dumb luck that either of you are still alive right now. He's not wrong? Look, luck or not, me and Hitomi have managed to get by safely. That's all that matters. What exactly is the relationship between you two anyway? Are you guys dating? Archie and Hitomi exchanged glances. When Hitomi hesitated uneasily, Archie decided he'd better speak up. No, it's not like that. We just happened to run into each other earlier today. Guess I'm not the kind of guy who can abandon someone in trouble. Can't abandon someone in trouble, huh? You sure you're not just trying to make yourself feel self-important? There are plenty of people out there that you can't see who are also in trouble, who are also suffering. If you only help the ones close at hand, then what's the point, really? The world's a lot bigger than you can imagine, and there's a lot you're blind to. So what, if I see someone who's in trouble, I'm supposed to just ignore them? Nah, I can't do that. If I see someone who's collapsed from hunger, I'm not gonna just walk on by because there are people starving somewhere else in the world. I'd be all, hey, let me treat you to a beef bowl, or whatever. You couldn't have come up with a smarter example? Stanley replied with a tiny laugh. Okay, so I'm an idiot, uh, she scowled. My bad. Stanley laughed again. Today has been an interesting day, he said. I was with another fellow earlier who was just like you. Meaning what? Was he an idiot too? Yeah, he was an idiot. Do all you Japanese have that problem? Hardly. My little sister's so smart she'd make your eyes pop out. Well, I'm sure relieved to hear that. If everyone in this country were as dumb as you guys, I might actually start to like this place. Huh? What does that even mean? Talk so I can understand, man. Actually shot back. But Stanley didn't respond. Instead he stuck his head out the car window, peering at the road ahead. They were close to Shibuya Station now, and the traffic had ground to a halt. Gridlock again? Stanley grumbled. It's probably better to walk the rest of the way to Endo Electronics. He pulled over on the side of the road. Specifically, the shoulder that runs along either side of the traveled portion of the roadway. A place where trash tossed out of the windows of moving cars tend to accumulate. Tossing cigarette butts and empty cans out onto the street can potentially hurt people, and it definitely makes a mess. Please, don't litter. Actually got out of the car, feeling his guts not up with worry. Pretty soon he was going to have to confront his father. Stanley gave Achi a look. Are you scared about meeting with your father? I'm not scared. First things first, I'm gonna punch him right in the face. Then we can have ourselves a chat. Don't let your emotions get out of control. Your father might be one of the key players in this case. I don't give a damn about that. Achi took Hitomi by the hand and started walking. They'd gone up and down Dogenzaka so many times today already. But this was probably the last time he and Hitomi would make their way up the hill together. Do we do we go quickly or do we go slowly? What a, what a decision this. Ache walked at an easy pace, wanting to delay the end of their time together just a little longer. Once they reached his home, this kidnapping case would be all over, because his own father, Daisuke, would be arrested as the culprit. Kidnapping for ransom carries a potential life sentence, with a definite term of imprisonment of no less than three years. Bringing Daisuke down would be easy. Archie wasn't worried about that part at all. If he didn't hold back, there was a good chance he'd wind up hurting his father. Holding back. Getting hurt. A memory from long ago rose in Archie's mind. A pure white karate gi. Thrusting out with his left fist. Daisuke collapsing to the floor. One of many memories of his father that Archie could not forget.
Kneeling before the memorial altar of his mother, Kotane, Achi wept uncontrollably. He clutched his ohajiki tightly in his hands. A toy made of small coin-shaped glass beads, somewhat similar to marbles. The typical game involves flicking one's pieces into the opponents with a fingertip. Specific rules vary greatly by the region. Achi had always been rather clingy with his mother. When she was alive, she had often joined him for ohajiki, origami, and the like. On this particular day, Achi had come home miserable after getting bullied by the neighborhood kids for acting like a wimp. Achi. He turned to see his father, holding two cups of shaved ice. Come here for a bit. They sat on the stairs together, eating their sweet frozen confections. You wanna get tougher? Daisuke's words were soft and simple. How about you and me get tougher together? Actually looked up at his father, frowning in confusion. How are we gonna do that? Well, for starters, how about we learn some karate? Karate? Achi's face twisted up unhappily at the idea. He couldn't even imagine himself punching or kicking anyone. It'll be alright, his dad said. I'll go with you, don't you worry. Daisuke flexed one of his scrawny arms. His biceps bulged up the tiniest bit. Archie was well aware that his father wasn't much of an athlete. There had been an athletics meet at his grade school. Even now, the memory of Daisuke tripping clumsily during the parent participation relay was burned into Archie's mind. A type of children's event where the parents who have come to watch their children compete are asked to join in with them. Daisuke took part in the tug of war, only to get tangled up in the rope and dragged over the line. Archie was understandably disheartened by his father's embarrassing display, but after eating the lunch his father had made for him, his spirits quickly returned. Daisuke had made rice balls that were clumsily oversalted, but Achi could tell her hard he'd worked to repair them. I guess, I mean, if you're gonna be there. And so the two began training together at a local karate dojo. There's dog sculptures in the background, look at them, it's cute. Archie put on his white gi and fastened his obi tightly. As he did so, he felt as if his feelings were being anchored in place as well. Itch, knee, sun. Achi's gi sleeves made a whooshing sound as he thrust out his fists in time with the sensei's chant. Even simple kata practice made him feel like he was getting stronger somehow. His dad, having left Suzune in the care of their neighbors, was working up a sweat alongside him. But he was out of shape, and his technique was shaky. He was soon exhausted, and went to lean up against the dojo wall. Achi stepped out of the training circle and called out to his father. Dad, are you okay? Yeah, I'm just gonna take a little break. Daisuke sounded like he was on the edge of hyperventilating. Thanks, Dad. Huh? What for? For asking me to come take karate lessons with you. Ashi was sure he'd never have dared to go to the dojo alone. Hey, just as so long as you're liking it. Now go on, get back to training. With a deep bow, Archie resumed his kata practice. As they were walking home from the dojo, Achi turned to his father. How come you want to get stronger, Dad? He asked. I mean, you're not getting bullied by your friends. Daisuke was quiet for a few moments before answering. His words came out awkward and embarrassed. I was picked on a lot when I was your age too, Archie. I had a friend who would always come and bail me out. A friend? Yeah, a friend. A distant look came to his father's eyes. He was a real fighter. I always looked up to him. I wanted to be strong like him. His expression turned lonely. I don't get to see him anymore though. Why not? Achi asked. Did he die? No, no, nothing like that. Then did you guys have a fight? Something like that. Daisuke smiled sadly. He stared out into the sky for a while before speaking up again. His name's Tatano. Hmm? My friend. That's his name. Achi's father increased his pace. Come on, he said. We have to go and pick up Suzune. 
After that, despite Achi's questions, Daisuke would say no more about his old friend. By the time he was almost done with grade school, Achi had grown up fit and strong, almost unrecognisable from his younger self. Perhaps he'd had the physical knack in him all along. He was chosen as the representative for the boys' karate team, even managing to take second place in a national tournament. Nobody bullied Achi anymore. One time, Daisuke suggested that the two of them do some sparring. Achi may have been a national competitor, sure, but he was still a grade schooler squaring off against an adult. His father had been training for close to two years now as well, and his confidence had grown accordingly. Achi was excited to be able to face off against his old man. Early on in their karate training, Achi's kumite had seemed rather hopeless. He'd been shocked that his out-of-shape father was able to overpower him, but also pleased to get a sense of how strong the man was. This time, Archie thought, he might well lose again, but he was going to go all out. As they adopted their fighting stances, Daisuke's face was full of confidence. The instructor gave his signal to begin, and Archie opened with a sharp, low kick. Daisuke didn't guard against it, the blow caught him in the thigh. It looked to Archie like he'd allowed himself to take the hit, not fearing the effect of a child's kick. Archie proceeded to unleash several more low kicks to the same spot. Bit by bit, Daisuke's face revealed his discomfort. Finally, he yanked his leg away. That was when Archie realized. His father wasn't letting himself get hit on purpose. He was just unable to keep up with the speed of his son's footwork. If that was the case, Archie felt bad about exploiting his dad's weakness. He decided to leave his leg alone. Instead, he aimed a punch at his father's midsection. He was shocked by the impact as the blow struck home. He hadn't attacked with a great deal of force. He'd just thrown a light midsection punch as a check. But as Archie pulled back his fist, Daisuke crumpled to the floor, writhing in pain as he clutched his gut. Achi stared in disbelief at his own hand. That was the last day that Daisuke went to the dojo. Your dad's pathetic. Yeah, he's such a loser. Achi was on his way home from practice, and some older students from the dojo had started ribbing on him. What? what did you just say? These kids were middle schoolers, but Achi wasn't about to back down. He thrust out with a quick punch, stopping it just short of one boy's nose. Go on, say that again. I'll kick your ass. The older boys went pale, then took off and ran. But the small victory did nothing to bolster Archie's spirits. His father would look so small and lonely, heading away after quitting karate. But Archie didn't think there was anything pathetic about that. Sure, maybe by now he was better at karate than his father. But really, what difference did that make? In growing stronger, he'd learn something. Using force to win out over someone else didn't mean anything. Strength alone didn't determine a person's worth. Achi loved and respected his father for going to the dojo with him. Beating him in a karate match didn't change the way he'd felt. I've pronounced that word differently every single time I've said it. I don't know how to do it. In the middle of an English passage. Archie resurfaced from his memories to hear Stanley talking on his phone. I see, so that's what's going on. Once we're finished with things in Dogenzaka, I'll bring Hitomi right back to the precinct. <laughs> Curious, Achi turned to the American. This choice is fake news. Who are you just talking to? Stanley's reply was clipped. That other idiot I was telling you about earlier. <laughs> Did I want the pronunciation call out? No. This is this is, okay. So like, it's one of those words like 
like, karaoke that is pronounced completely differently in common English vernacular than you are actually supposed to say it, and it always fucks me up on the read. Because I, if I, if I tell someone karaoke, they will not get it. If I say karaoke, they will get it, but that's totally wrong. Karaoke. Yeah, in British English, it almost always becomes karaoke, but it's karaoke. And like, karate is karate. Or like, I probably said that wrong. I'm not good at that one. Ka karate? Karate. Ka <laughs> With that, Stanley proceeded to wrap up his phone call. Guess I'm not going to get much out of this guy, actually thought. It's it's the common Japanese words in the middle of the English passage that's causing me to like do I do I go with the way you say it in like British English even though it's totally wrong or <laughs> like By now they could see Endo Electronics up ahead. Achi was about to hurry inside when Stanley stopped him. I'll go in first. You two wait out here. No way, this is my dad we're talking about. And you don't think it's dangerous to bring Hitomi right to him. Excuse me, I have congestion. Well, alright. We'll wait here for a bit, and once we know it's safe, we'll head on in. You cool with that? I'm cool with that. Stanley stepped inside. Actually fussed about impatiently, staring at the entryway. The palm of his clenched fist was sweating. Never before in his life had he wanted to just deck his old man. Hitomi watched him uneasily. Hitomi... Yes? I'm sorry. I really don't want you to have to see this. But I think you're about to witness the crowning shame in Endo family history. Achi, don't say that, Hitomi said. She squeezed his hand. He found his other fist unclenching. Please, you have to try to talk to your father. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Suddenly, there was a loud crash from inside the building. The time for waiting had passed. Let's go! Achin Hitomi raced inside. Barging into the living quarters without bothering to shed his shoes, he heard his father's voice coming from the workroom. Dad! Achi hurried through the workroom door and saw Stanley holding his father pinned across a desk. Let me go! Please, let me go! Daisuke thrashed both of his legs. Stanley, please, let my father go. I want to talk to him. Stanley snorted dismissively, but did as he was asked. Daisuke stood up, rubbing at a sore wrist. Dad, please, you have to tell me. Where is Maria? Maria? What are you talking about? Daisuke wouldn't meet his eyes. Don't play dumb with me. Actually pointed at Hitomi. You know who this is, don't you? Hitomi Osawa, the girl you've been after. Maria is her sister. But Daisuke remained silent. You're gonna pretend you didn't call the hospital? Nothing about maybe being able to get your hands on a heart? I mean, seriously? It's all so simple. Even I can tell what's been going on. You've been watching me and Hitomi through the surveillance cameras, and you were telling that guy with the cane where we were. The blood began to drain from his father's face. Don't you go quiet on me. If I'm wrong, then go ahead. Tell me the truth. Daisuke's arm shot out suddenly, knocking an external hard drive from his desk onto the floor. It was over and done before Stanley could stop him. Stanley hunched down and picked up the shattered drive. I'm guessing there was important data on here. Footage from the cameras, maybe? I have no idea what you're talking about, Daisuke spat. You can't do this to an innocent person, Dad, Achi shouted, grabbing his father by the collar. There was a sound of footsteps from out in the shop. Someone was quickly getting closer. Stanley grabbed Hitomi by the hand and pulled her back against the wall.
actually stiffened as he turned his gaze to the door. Oh no! Where's this jump? Fucking end! End! Before I do this jump though, I wanna pee. Again. Always pee. The workroom door slowly eased open. Actually, was too shocked for words. Someone posed like that Spider-Man pointing at Spider-Man image. The girl who entered looked just like Hitomi. Maria! Hitomi! Actually blinked in bewilderment. It was almost as if Hitomi were standing in front of a mirror. The two girls look so similar. Maria, thank goodness you're alright. I'm so sorry I had you worried. Maria was safe, Achi realized. At last, he had managed to fulfill his duty. You... how did you manage to get out of the storeroom? Daisuke had gone pale. Tell me, Maria said sharply. Who was it who came up with this kidnapping plan? Suddenly, Daisuke shoved Maria aside and lunged for Hitomi. Stanley moved to stop him, but before he could intervene, the older man had, hold, bleh, had a hold on Hitomi, pressing something that looked like a flashlight up against her neck. Dad? Echi started toward him, but Stanley held up a hand. Don't move, that's a stun gun. A piece of self-defense equipment for repelling would be attackers with an electrical shock. There are several types, including baton-type stun prods and guns that fire needles attached to flexible wires. The latter type is especially bleh, the latter type especially is frequently referred to in the U.S. as a taser or taser gun, due to the popular models produced by Taser International, now Axon. Stun guns are used not only by civilians but also by law enforcement and military personnel for non-lethal applications. If he zaps her in the neck, it could kill her. You know your stuff, Daisuke said. You deal in American electronics? No, I do this for a living. Stanley drew his gun in an instant, taking aim at Daisuke's forehead. Two B's, two A's, three B's. A, A, suddenly A's. Wait, hold on. Actually interposed himself between Stanley and his father. Dad, let Hitomi go. You need to stop this nonsense. 
Achi walks slowly toward his father, a pleading look in his eyes. Nonsense? Which one of us is talking nonsense here? You don't know what's going on. If you knew everything, then you'd be helping me. What do you mean, everything? With this girl's heart, we can save Suzanne. Dad, who was it exactly that told you that? Daisuke did not reply. I asked you a question. Who was it that put this crazy idea into your head? Uh, a foreign organ trafficker I met at the hospital. In Japan, a medical professional known as a transplant coordinator handles the liaison between the donor and recipient parties. But there are many cases of illegal or borderline illegal activity carried out by third-party organ brokers. There are countries where organ transplants are openly performed for monetary gain, and no shortage of specialists willing to do the job. These questionable markets include suppliers who source viable organs and tissue for transplant from cadavers. Stanley let out a snort. A likely story. It's true. I was suspicious at first myself, Daisuke said stubbornly. But I couldn't just sit around and wait for Susan A to die. And after talking to him about her rare blood type and all the difficulties in performing a transplant, he promised he'd do everything in his power. Daisuke's hands were trembling. Tears welled up in his vacant and bloodshot eyes. Then a while later, he got back in touch and told me he'd found a potential match. Someone with the same blood type as Susan A, and roughly the same age. But then he told me that the girl was still alive. And so what was the point? Her heart might be a match for Susan A's, but it didn't matter if we couldn't get our hands on it. And I said that, but the man told me. He told you what? That she bit his lip. He told me to abduct her and turn her over to him. After that, he'd find a way to make it all work. At last, Daisuke had confessed. Now Achi had to try to come to grips with the truth he had just heard. I had to do something, his father continued vehemently. I had to abduct this girl and see things through. I just couldn't take it. Kotsune had already been taken from me. The thought of losing Suzune too... I had to make sure I didn't fail. So it was this organ trafficker who came up with the kidnapping scheme then. He kept his gun aimed at his target. Daisuke nodded. Describe him for me. He was tall and had black hair, spoke fluent Japanese. Stanley raised an eyebrow at that. I actually wondered if he had some idea who it might be. And taking Maria Osawa hostage in order to lure Hitomi, that was his idea as well? Yeah, yes, that's right. I allowed his computer to access my surveillance camera system as well. But then, this morning, I got a call from the hospital saying Suzanne's condition was critical. I couldn't wait any longer. I had to help my girl right away. And then... Daisuke cut himself off, reaffirming his grip on this stun gun. I was looking at the surveillance monitor and I saw a detective I happened to know. He was right next to this girl here, and so I decided to ask him. I knew if I did, he wouldn't refuse. He could never refuse a request from me. And that was the man with the cane? Achi asked. His voice was low and hoarse. Yes, I was giving him directions while I followed you on the monitors. Dad, you need to let go of Hitomi now. There's no point to this. Archie took another step closer to his father. There is a point. If I kill this girl here and now, your sister can get the surgery she needs. But even Archie knew that things couldn't possibly work out that way. His father had grown so desperate to help Suzanne that he'd lost all sense of judgement. Why, Achi? Why won't you help me? Don't you want to save Suzanne? Daisuke made a pathetic sight. And yet his desperation to save his child was so palpable it was heartrending. Achi thought back to that time he'd laid his father out when sparring. No matter how pathetic he may have looked, Achi had always felt that sense of paternal love from him. You're not going to be able to talk him down, Stanley murmured. Archie shook his head. Stanley, he said. Lower your gun. Tears were welling up in his eyes. Please. Lower your gun. Hearing the determination in Archie's voice, Stanley quietly complied. 
Achi stepped up to Daisuke, getting a firm grip on his father's slender shoulder. Dad. Of course I want to help Suzune. Then why are you trying to stop me? Dad, do you think this is what she'd want you to do? Daisuke's face fell. Did Suzune ask for this, Dad? Did she tell you to take someone else's heart so she could live longer? Did she, Dad? Suddenly the fight seemed to ebb from Daisuke's body. The stun gun hung limply in his hand. If Suzune asked me to go and get someone's heart for her, I wouldn't object. I'd help her, just like she wanted. I wouldn't let you bear those crimes by yourself. But that's not what this is, is it? Suzune would never ask us to do something like this, would she? By now, tears were streaming down Archie's cheeks. He knew that his father thought about Suzune more than he thought of anyone else. And so he should know full well that she would never want this. Suzune's not like me. She's smart, she's kind, and she'd never be happy about taking someone else's heart. Even if it saved her life, I'm sure she'd never accept that. She wouldn't be able to live with it knowing something so horrible had happened to someone else for her sake. Isn't that the Suzune we know? Daisuke's cheeks were smeared with tears now as well. But then... then we're not going to be able to help her. The sound of father and son weeping echoed through the workroom. Maybe so. Maybe we won't. But that's better than the misery and suffering she'd have to live with. Daisuke slumped to his knees on the floor, collapsing like a crumbling mound of sand. Hitomi, freed from his grip, stood motionless. There were tears in her eyes, too. You're such an idiot, Dad. Such a complete, utter idiot. Sobbing, Achi embraced his father. There was a sudden thud from near the door. Everyone turned to look. Maria had crumpled to the floor, and a newcomer had appeared. At some point, Kanan had silently entered the room. Now she cradled Maria in her arms. Standing in the doorway was a man Achi didn't recognize, his face pale. Later. Stay back! Kanan shouted at Achi when he tried to approach. It looked like Maria had fallen unconscious. Achi's heart was racing in his chest. An eerie silence fell over the room. For several seconds, no one said a word, their eyes all fixed on Maria. Finally, Kanan looked up, her face ashen. It's starting. After the young man's desperate pleading, the other fellow, apparently his father, finally gave in. He released his hold on Hitomi. The tension in the room was replaced by a solemn air of gravitas. Seeing father and son weeping as they spoke made Kano think back to his conversation with Tatano before the stakeout. What was it in people that drove them to do such horrible things? Sometimes it was the desire to save the ones they loved. Even such a heartfelt human emotion could drive someone to wrongdoing. Why? Why do people have to be like that? A sudden thud snapped Kano out of his musing. An instant later, Kanan hurried past him into the workroom. Mm. 
Maria had collapsed on the floor, and now Kanan was beside her. In a panic, Kano rushed into the workroom as well. Stay back! Kanan shouted as the other tried to huddle around the fallen girl. Please don't be what I think this is. Had the virus gone symptomatic? Two hours ago, Stanley had told Kano that Maria was infected. He'd also said that her symptoms wouldn't develop for another four hours. Shouldn't they still have two more hours to go? Maria looked like she was dead, her eyes closed, her body motionless. Hitomi tried to approach despite Kanan's warning. Maria, she cried. Maria, what's wrong? Kano held his arms wide to hold her back. Your sister has been infected with the Ua virus. The Ua virus? Hitomi's face went pale. Hey, Kano said to Kanan. Should you really be that close? If she's developed symptoms... But Kanan didn't move from Maria's side. She calmly rested her hand on the other girl's forehead. There's no fever, she said. And there's no blood coming from her ears. No lymph swelling. I'll be alright. She hasn't gone symptomatic yet. In that case, why did she collapse? Hitomi asked. I'm not sure yet. Whatever the case, if you don't get her that antiviral, she's done for. Then we have to get her to the lab right away, Hitomi said. She was trembling with anxiety. No, that's not an option. Kano's tone was grave. You may already be aware, Miss Osawa, but without a password, we can't access the antiviral storage. But when I went there, my father and Mr. Tanaka... Mamoru Tanaka is dead. Murdered. What? She stared at him uncomprehendingly. No. No, that can't be true. He was a member of a crime syndicate. It's possible they killed him in order to silence him. So then... There's no way to save my sister? There was a hollow look in Hitomi's eyes. No, I won't accept that. Why? Why can't we help her? But no one had an answer. Kano gritted his teeth and hung his head. Why did it have to come to this? He'd come this far, but there was nothing he could do, and he hated himself for it. I'll go to the laboratory. It was Kanan. Electronic lock breaking is my specialty. Wait, the young man, Archie, spoke up suddenly. So you're a martial arts badass, but your specialty is lock breaking? He looked positively dumbstruck. Kanan ignored him, thinking out loud. Brute force. It's, uh, a crypt analyst technique that involves test input of all theoretically possible patterns. If time were unlimited, this would be the most reliable means of decipherment. However, in practice, the process takes massive amounts of time and computational power and can be defeated by systems that prohibit access after a limited number of failed input attempts. Side channel, shortcut... Rather than trying to decipher the password itself, this method involves analyzing information from the device, such as processing time, power consumption, and electromagnetic leaks, and using these details to exploit the system. Isolating the run state of devices is a crucial element of countering side channel attacks. A crypt analyst method that uses mathematical algorithms to carry out efficient bulk calculations against a block cipher that makes use of a shared key for encryption and decryption. Even when such calculations are theoretically possible, however, in practice the process requires large amounts of time, and the block cipher is seldom at real risk. Given the situation, I think I have to go with side channel. Side channel? Stanley asked. Where's your equipment? One of the lab PCs will suffice. I can connect to a special server from the net. I don't really understand the stuff you're talking about, Archie said, but I'll trust you to handle this. I mean, you did risk your life to save Hitomi from that minivan explosion and all. Kanan nodded. I have to warn you in advance, though. Crypt analysts can take hours and still yield no results. I can't guarantee I'll be able to get the doors unlocked before Maria develops symptoms. I understand, Hitomi said. Achi nodded, too. No one present had any objections. All of a sudden, there was a curious sound from somewhere in the room. What's that? Kano asked. What's making that noise? He looked around the workroom. That's... that's my computer. Daisuke hurried to his desktop. The bank of monitors which had been displaying surveillance camera footage from around Shibuya had all gone black. What the hell? What's going on, Dad? Achi joined his father, staring at the computer screens. It's all gone. The camera footage. It's been deleted. 
Daisuke blinked in disbelief. Now then, it seems our main cast has all been assembled. A man's voice, distorted by a voice modulator, suddenly emerged from the computer speakers. No, we're still missing Minori Kawa, actually. A moment later, the monitors all began to display a view inside the workroom. Dad, what the hell is this? Someone's broken through our firewall. Random tech gargon. Yay. A security system for preventing unauthorized intrusion into a computer network. The term stems from a metaphorical reapplication of the concept of a wall meant to inhibit the spread of fire or other destructive forces. They've hijacked the surveillance camera system. The color drained from Daisuke's face as he looked at the screens. Where are they filming us from? Kano asked, scanning the inside of the room. He used the image on the monitors to guess where the camera might be located. Over here? The lens of, of a camera sat atop the computer monitor glimmered like an eye. It was a miniature camera, used for web conferencing and the like. Now that Maria and Hitomi are both there, you've probably surmised the situation at hand. And so I offer a proposal. The laboratory password in exchange for Hitomi's blood. Realizing now that it was Alfred's voice they were hearing, everyone in the room froze. At 7 o'clock, roughly one hour from now, See that Hitomi Osawa is waiting at the scramble intersection outside Shibuya Station, just like this morning. Unless, of course, you're feeling particularly confident. You do have Kanan with you. Perhaps you'd care to take a gamble on her lock-breaking skills instead. Kanan clucked her tongue in frustration. Alfred had known exactly what the plan was. Of course, if Kanan isn't able to get the door open in time, what will you do then? Maria is sure to die, yes, but that's not all. If you don't agree to my offer, I have the means of creating another Maria, and a third. These infectees will spread the virus through Tokyo. The death toll will likely number in the hundreds of thousands. It is difficult to predict the scope of infection in the event of a bioterrorist attack employing a highly infectious viral agent in a city with a large mobile population. In a worst case scenario, some researchers estimate as many as several million infected in a matter of days. So do think carefully before you decide. Alfred's voice was chillingly matter-of-fact. I will appear at the rendezvous in person. After all, it wouldn't do for the star of the show to miss the final curtain. I'm looking forward to meeting all of you then. Silence fell. Then the images on the computer monitor returned to normal. The surveillance camera footage came back online as well. Daisuke promptly yanked out his ethernet cable and slammed his fists on the keyboard. Damn it, there was a hole in the fireball. We'll have to redo my security from the ground up. There was a hole in the wall. <laughs> Good call, Kanan said calmly. We can't win this if our intel keeps getting leaked. Stanley pursed his lips in consternation. What do we do? Kano asked him. Do we give in to his demands? I mean, do we really expect he's just going to blithely show up like that? He's practically begging for us to come and catch him. There had to be some deeper plan at work. If it means saving my sister, I'll do it. Hitomi was resolute. No, Stanley said, you can't. What? Why not? Because if you do, you'll be killed. What? Hitomi's voice caught in her throat. With the antivirus still present in your body a week after the fact, you're too much of a liability for Alpha to just let go. He's right, don't do it. Hitomi, you can't go. Even still, I... I want to do it. Hitomi stared defiantly at Stanley. You still want to go even knowing that you'll be killed? I can't just sit here and hope that Kanan is able to pull this off, she said. I want to do something for my sister. I want to save her. She peered down at Maria, sprawled on the floor. She'd object to me going, I'm sure of that. But I want to do what I can. To do things my way. No one tried to contradict her this time. If she's willing to take the risk, then there are things the rest of you can do too. It was Kanan again. Let's hear it, Kano replied. He squared his shoulders. He was of the same mind as Hitomi. He couldn't just do nothing and leave it all on Kanan. After everything he'd been through, he wanted to stick with this case until the very end. Apprehend Alfred at the rendezvous and demand the password from him. Kanan offered the suggestion as if it were a simple task. That lets you get what you want without putting Hitomi in danger. Kano let out a sigh. Hold on, he said. 
Even if we do arrest him, how are we going to get him to cough up the password? We don't have time to drag him off to an interrogation room. And besides, he doesn't strike me as the sort to offer a confession that easily. There are ways, Kanan said. Once Alfred has made contact with Hitomi, call my cell phone. Hitomi tilted her head. Call you? I have plenty of information Alfred might want to bargain for. I can negotiate with him directly. Kano considered Kanan's proposal. I see. So we'll try both options. Attempt to hack the password at the lab, and also try negotiating with Alfred. That gives us two chances. With that tiny ray of hope, Hitomi's face brightened some. We're split into two groups. One for the lab, and one for Shibuya Station, Kanan said. Let's exchange phone numbers so we can be in touch when the time comes. The group quickly shared contact info as suggested. Hitomi and Kanan called one another's phones to be sure. Hitomi's cheerful ringtone felt out of place, but also somehow soothing, a fragment of normalcy in the midst of crisis. Well, guess we're all set then, Hitomi said, looking down at the LCD screen. Her expression turned apologetic. I'm sorry, Kanan, for having to keep putting things on you. Hey, Kanan replied. Don't worry about it. Okay, now I guess I should call my father. Hitomi called Kenji Osawa on his cell, asking him to let Maria and Kanan into the lab. Kano leaned in to whisper into Kanan's ear. Are you sure you're okay with this? With what? I know that you're after Alfred. Are you sure you want to go to the lab and not? Right now I want to save Maria. That's all. Her tone was as curt and mechanical as ever, but there was a fierce gleam of determination in her eyes. Maria was clearly someone very special to her. All right, Kano replied. Leave Alfred to me. He thumped himself on the chest. He'd succeed this time, no matter what the odds. Kano could scarcely recall the whirlwind of events that had brought him here. Yeah, word. He'd somehow survived a dozen disasters. Even now, a dear friend was in the hospital, at risk of dying. There were times when he'd been ready to give up. And yet, at the end of it all, here he was. His opponent was an international terrorist. No matter how you looked at it, that wasn't a matchup for a mere detective. But I'm going to do it anyway. Rumi, Shizuo, Sasayama, and Detective Tatano. I'm going to take down Alfred and save Maria Osawa's life. Just you watch and see. I give that big slam! Tanaka hadn't give I his password. Osawa's last chance had gone up in smoke. He let out a long, shaky breath and shut his eyes tight. Was it true? Was there nothing more he could do? Osawa's cell phone rang. When he saw the name on the incoming call display, he nearly shouted out loud. It was Hitomi. Hitomi? Are you alright? Please, tell me you're alright. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. But... Maria's... Maria? Is Maria there with you? Osawa's heart leaped. Dad, there isn't any time for me to explain everything, so I'll just have to give you the main points. This is so we can save my sister, so just stay calm and listen. Osawa struggled to hold back the thousand questions that immediately came boiling into his mind. There's a girl named Kanan who's going to bring Maria to the lab. She's going to try to hack the password in order to get us inside. Wait, hold on, just what in the world is going on? There are a bunch of people here working to help save Maria. Can you wait for us at the lab, Dad? I'm not sure that electronic lock is something that'll be so easy to... We've got another plan in motion too, and if that goes well, we might be able to learn the password. It was all too much to follow, but Osawa realized he'd have to take Hitomi at her word. It was their only hope of saving Maria. Alright, he said. I'll do as you ask, but... You said you're trying two approaches. You're not going to be in danger, are you? No, I'll be fine. Don't worry about me. Okay, very well. I'm heading to the laboratory now. You can't! You can't go! The moment Osawa hung up and started for the house, I clung to him from behind. 
If you use the antiviral now, she said, everything will go public. There's no way we can keep the virus or the antiviral under wraps at this point. Osawa tried to pull free, but his wife was stronger than he expected. Besides, if Maria infects other people, the whole world is going to find out in a matter of hours. No, we can just quarantine her. If it's handled correctly, we'll still be able to retain secrecy. Ai's voice was cold as ice. Do you... Do you even have any idea what you're saying right now? I do. I know how it sounds. But this is... This is the only thing. The only thing I can... Her voice trailed off. He could feel the force of her trembling where she held him. Have I really put you into that much of a corner? Osawa slipped from Ai's arms and prostrated himself on the ground in front of her. I'm sorry. I'm truly, truly sorry. Oh, stop this! Get up! If you're really sorry, then don't go to that lab! But Osawa remained silent, his forehead pressed into the dirt. If you use that antivirus without corporate approval, your time with Okoshi is finished. That doesn't matter to me anymore. How can you say that? Virology is the only thing you've ever cared about. I began pummeling his back. Maybe virology is all that I care about. I don't know the first thing about anything else. I never wanted to know. Never even thought to find out. Never bothered to learn what you or my own children might think. I'm a failure. As a father, and as a husband. How dare you say that only after it's come to this! I struck him again, harder than before. You're right, he gasped out the words between her blows. Maybe this has been too long coming, but it's not too late. I can still start over. Start over? She paused in disbelief. You already turned down that American job. If you use that antiviral now, there won't be any starting over. You'll lose everything. Will I lose you too? After you've gone and thrown everything else away like this? How could I possibly stay with you? I was sobbing softly now. Osawa wondered what her tears were for. But there was one thing he did know. She was right. They couldn't be together anymore. He got to his feet and headed back into the house, leaving Ai behind. He hurried through the back entrance and went into the garage. Climbed into his car, fastened his seatbelt, and took a deep breath. The image of a younger Maria arose in the back of his mind. There she was at that park, getting drenched by the rain, holding back her tears as she waited for her father. Wait for me, Maria. This time, I'm going to come for you. I was wrong. Going to the lab wouldn't mean losing everything. He'd let too many important things slip through his fingers. Now it was time to go take them back. Osawa pulled his car onto the street and sped toward the laboratory. As if to signal that the long day was drawing to a close, the dazzling sun sank down between the buildings in the distance. My eyes just went widened a bit there when I saw the timer expand by two hours. Mmm, that's a two hour time block, baby! That's <laughs> six to eight. Eh? Oh, 
completely. Uh, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna refill my uh, my water bottle real quick and take a piss, and we're gonna jump right back into it. You'll forgive me as well if I take a moment to take a break and like eat a pop tart. This is the good shit. Why are Pop-Tarts disgusting? They're not disgusting, they're really good snacks. They're ridiculously sweet. They are sweet. They're so sweet.
Wait, really? If you fight the cockroach, you get a bad ending? We gotta go back and see it right now. Ugh, ridiculous. This bottle is not tight enough. I have spilled summer fruits all over my jeans. Nah, fuck this game. It's time to play poppin' music. Hang in there, Chiaki. Just keep it together. The Norikara rushed to her side and offered her a hand. Surely it hardly matters at this point. You're not going to make it on time regardless, Katayama said coldly. And in any case, if four-star general gossip doesn't get released, it's Mr. Toyama who's going to be in trouble, not you. I dare say that we'll be better off with one third-rate gossip rag less anyway. Shut your mouth, Chiaki snapped. If the gossip doesn't come out, I am going to be in trouble. An article I've written is supposed to be in next month's issue. It's a piece I've worked my very hardest on, to the very end. A piece Mr. Mino saw fit to put in print. And so if that goes away... If all of that goes away... Yeah, I'll be in trouble, alright. <clears throat> Chiaki's legs wobbled as he struggled to get back to her feet. Chiaki, Kateyama said, your zeal is a marvelous thing. Worthy of admiration, even. But when it comes to work, results are all that matters. I'm sad to have to put it that way, but I must be honest. It's just common decency. Katayama glanced at his pocket watch. You have 57 minutes and 10 seconds remaining. At this rate, you won't even make it to the interview venue before your time's up. Frankie? Frankie? Frankly, I don't think even a further extension of your deadline would make any difference in the end. Damn it! Minorikawa ground his teeth. <laughs> he wondered if he should just leave Chiaki here and go interview SOS by himself. He could expand the article on SOS, then work a small part of Chiaki's interview piece in to at least fill the layout. Right now, the single most important thing was getting the magazine out the door, for Toyama's sake. But if he did cut most of Chiaki's copy after all she'd done, he might wind up totally killing her passion for being a writer. I have to stop waffling. Professionals don't let their personal feelings dictate their decisions. I can help Chiaki work through her emotional struggles later. How does this all tie back in? Minori Kawa seems distant right now. From, like, the main thread going on with the other two. Chiaki, that's enough. The young woman got to her feet, staggering as she began to climb the stairs. I'm not giving up, she said under her breath. I can't give up now. Though obviously in pain, she struggled to keep her legs moving. I know it'll come, but I'm wondering out loud. Damn, I can't do it. Look how hard she's fighting to stay in the game. I can't tell her I don't need her article now. Releasing the next issue of the gossip wasn't just going to save Toyama, it would save Chiaki as well. Minorikawa couldn't abandon either one of them. Which left him with a hell of a dilemma. He needed to make a decision. If he didn't stop wavering soon, they'd be out of time. But try as he might, he couldn't come up with a plan. Then he heard a familiar voice from behind him. If you're wondering what path to take, allow my taxi to be your guide. Motherfucking Kimizuka. Minorikawa spun around to see motherfucking Kimizuka standing there. Where to, sir? The driver asked. Despite his polite demeanor, his pride was obvious. Mr. Kimizuka, I appreciate the thought, but with this traffic. Traffic? I see nothing of the sort. 
Okay, sure, but... Hinori Kawa was well aware of Kimizuka's capabilities, but the prospect of cutting through the chaos that currently filled the streets was more than a little daunting. When you know this town as well as I do, there's no way you can't go. Alright, what other choice do I have? I guess I've got to trust you. This will be my last request of the day. Minori Kawa pointed down the street. <laughs> Take us to the labyrinth? Take us to the labyrinth in Uraharajuku. A complex series of passageways designed to be difficult or confusing to navigate. A maze. It will indeed be, qu be quite easy to get lost or disoriented in the place where Minori Kara is going, and where you're going too. But any maze can be solved with enough effort. All you need is perseverance and wit, though taking frequent notes wouldn't hurt either. Best of luck. Pardon? The labyrinth in Uraharajuku, you said? Kimizuka quirked an eyebrow. Is something the matter? No, nothing at all. Hurry up and get in. As soon as Minori Kara and the others had climbed into the cab, Kimizuka tore off through Shibuya's network of narrow side streets. The passengers in the back seat jostled roughly back and forth to the sound of screeching tires. This is altogether far too excessive, Katayama murmured, wincing as his head bounced repeatedly against the window. To think we allow such inconsiderate driving here in this country. Chiaki, meanwhile, had opened her laptop and was somehow working furiously to finish her copy. The sound of her fingers clicking across the keys echoed within the vehicle. How's it going, Chiaki? Minorikawa asked. Just a little more! Her eyes were glued to her monitor, her face all seriousness. Kimizuka glanced over at Minorikawa. If I may ask, sir, what business do you have at this labyrinth? Just a little interview. I hear a local gang called SOS uses the place as their big hangout. Uh, but that was Inferno. <laughs> You're interviewing SOS? Sir, I feel it might be best not to get too involved with that lot. There was something about the driver's warning that seemed a little off. Do your taxi driver connections tell you what SOS is up to? Minorikawa asked. Originally they were something of a vigilante corps in the name of keeping the neighborhood clean and safe. But lately I hear nothing but bad things about them. These, those loan sharks had said something very similar. Minorikawa reminded himself that he'd better be on his guard. Katayama chimed in. And just how do you plan to go about interviewing a Gan like this? That's nothing for you to worry about. I have a plan. Oh, and just what exactly is this plan? It's a secret. Katayama gave him a derisive grin. Clearly he wasn't impressed. Minorikawa turned to look at Chiaki. She appeared too engrossed in her copy to even hear the conversation. I realize this is for work, Kimizuka said worriedly. But do you really need to take such risks? Yes, I do. Minorikawa thought back to that look on Toyama's face. That look when he'd finally regained his confidence. He couldn't let Heaven Publishing go under. Toyama provided the canvas on which Minorikawa shared his art with the world. Thinking about it now, Minorikawa realized he'd always been chasing Toyama's shadow. But it was galling to admit the man had been the ideal Minorikawa strove to live up to. That was why he'd hated seeing Toyama reduced to such a pathetic state. He wanted Toyama to remain indomitable, to keep busting down any and all obstacles in his own peculiar way. Still, Minorikawa wasn't about to voice these feelings aloud. He felt more than a little embarrassed to be taking it all so personally. When you take on a job, you give it 100% every time. That's what makes you a professional, he said. Wouldn't you agree? I do indeed, Katayama chimed in. But you'll have to demonstrate that 100% in the limited time you have left. Which, by the way, is 51 minutes and 30 seconds. And I will not budge in the slightest on that submission deadline. Please do keep that in mind. The man took another look at his watch. I've got half a mind to break that thing, Minorikawa told him. Breaking my watch will not stop time. Minorikawa shot him a furious glare, but Katayama's composure was unwavering. The guy was unflappable, and the only way Minorikawa was going to be able to put him in his place was to meet his damn deadline. Easier said than done, though. He'd want to use 30 of the 51 minutes he still had to write his article. That only left him 20 or so to get the material. 
Kimizuka suddenly slammed on the brakes, and the cab skidded to a halt. Minorikawa stared through the windshield in shock and saw a smallish boxy minivan weaving erratically along the road. Whoa, look out! That thing's heading our way! Don't worry, sir, the driver replied. Just leave this to me. Keeping his cool, Kimizuka dexterously steered them clear of the oncoming vehicle. As the minivan sped past, an eerily cold breeze wafted over the taxi. The vehicle is being driven by members of the Wandering Angels Theatre Troupe. They're on their way to return the dry ice machine they used in their performance to Endo Electronics. The machine is malfunctioning, continually spitting out white plumes of carbon dioxide. The true members inside the van are beginning to suffer from oxygen deprivation and are driving around Shibuya in a daze. Will they be able to make it to Endo Electronics in the end? What the heck was that? Minori Kara asked. I'm not sure, Kimizuka said, but let's hurry on our way. Nimbly manipulating the gear stick, he stomped on the gas once more. Here we are, sir. They pulled up outside of a dilapidated, dilapidated old pool hall. You're a lifesaver. Minorikawa clapped a hand on Kimizuka's shoulder. Just be sure to be careful, sir. Minorikawa nodded. Huh? What? Chiaki asked, looking up. What are we being careful about? Nothing, Minorikawa said. You just wait here in the car. You've still got that copy to finish up, yeah? Uh, well, yes. Alright then. Chiaki frowned, but resumed her typing. And you wait here too, Minorikawa said to Katayama. But of course, that goes without saying. Inci Whoa. Incidentally, you have 49 minutes and 6 seconds remaining. Minorikawa did some quick mental math. With the half hour he'd already set aside, that left him 19 minutes. However dangerous SOS might be, he couldn't afford to hesitate for even a single second. Bracing himself, he stepped out of the taxi and headed for the pool hall. Phew. Minorikawa took a deep breath as he approached the grimy door. Here goes. He drew his leg back and gave the door a hearty kick. What the heck? What is this place? Minori Kawa had come to a pitch black void. I don't know what I was expecting, but not that. A cold wind blew from deep within the darkness, carrying with it the sound of a bestial roar. It almost looks like a dungeon of some sort, Minori Kawa said. Well, I anticipated this much. He pulled a fountain pen from his pocket. It's no good bringing your gear with you if you don't actually equip it, he said. Pen clutched firmly in his right hand, he strode boldly into the darkness. Oh, a branching path, huh? He'd been walking for some time now. Up ahead, there was a T that led both left and right. And that sign there looks pretty important. Minorikawa peered closely at the four lines written there. The honest one tells no lies. A liar never tells the truth. One is honest, two are liars. <laughs> See if you can find what's true. Ha! Huh, seeking the truth, huh? That's something I can get fired up about. Minorikawa decided to go... After making his way along a chilly passage, he emerged into a chamber of about ten square meters. Hey! A green cat wore a white sign around its neck. I have whiskers. What's that all about? The green cat grinned proudly at Minorikawa's inquiry. It's a hint, the cat said. It's saying that whatever it is has whiskers. Hmm, I see. So by getting hints like this, I'll eventually be able to solve some riddle and win the challenge? 
Ah, I can't answer any questions. All you get is what's written here. Now, proceed. I don't need to fight you or anything? Nothing of the sort. I'm not much into pain, really. Instead, I'll leave you with a warning. The green cat lowered its voice. There's a liar in here. A liar? Yes, the blue cat is a liar. Only the green cat tells the truth. The blue cat is a liar? <laughs> Keep that in mind and be on your way. You mustn't believe what the blue cat tells you. Alrighty then, see ya! <laughs> and with that, the green cat scampered off down the passageway. Minorikawa followed in the same direction. We came to a dead end. There was a large hole in the floor. A ladder extended down through the darkness. There appeared to be no other way to continue. Minorikawa headed down. From the bottom of the long ladder, another passageway stretched out. Minorikawa squinted, but it was too dark to see how far the tunnel might go on. He could still turn back, but it wasn't the Minorikawa way to bail out after coming so far. He walked onward, never looking back. This is an elaborate fucking... A choice of left and right again. What the... What's this bullshit about, chat? What the fuck are you playing at here? Am I drawing a map? Of course not. Why would I do that? I don't have any paper. Play my game? Okay, fine. God fucking Jesus. No, this won't do. That's not blank. I know, I can use the notes page in the back of the instruction book for Dance Dance Revolution second mix. I can also destroy my disc in the process by dropping it off the desk. Oh, there's a music list in here. This manual doesn't actually have a notes page. This fucking case is a bit shit. Yeah, that's why the middle shit's kind of broken. The eBay seller will lose one star for this. <laughs> what did we vote for? I think we voted for B. Hey, again. The blue cat greeted him unenthusiastically. As before, it wore a sign around its neck. Nori Carr read the message. I can't move under my own power. Huh. He jotted the words down on the palm of his hand. Ah, shoot. I wrote can't moot by mistake. He tried to <laughs> rub out the misspelled word with his fingers, but only managed to smudge the ink around. You got that? Yeah, you got that. Later then. Hey, hold up! Minorikawa called out before the blue cat could disappear. What is it? The cat asked. Well, I kind of messed up the note I just took. Then hurry up and fix it. Sorry about this. Okay, got it. Later then. Hold up. What now? I have to ask, are you the liar? No, I'm not. The red one is the liar. Really? Really? You can rest easy on that. Now I really do need to be going. Wiping away the text from the whiteboard around its neck, the blue cat turned and vanished into the darkness. Minori Kawa followed in the same direction. He came to a dead end. There was a large hole in the floor. A ladder extended down through the darkness. There appeared to be no other way to continue. It was practically begging him to climb down it. From the bottom of the long ladder stretched another passageway. Cause this is fucking good. Is repeating the dialogue as well as bitch ass. Sweet smelling? Don't go left. So go left, right?
We have one for A, two, two for two for A, one for forward. The right it is. <laughs> Blue cat stood there, panting raspily. Minori Kara read the words written on its white sign. I'm round. That's right. And that's no lie. It's the red cat who tells lies, after all. Right, got it. Make sure you hammer this hint into your head, okay? I'll be fine. Right, time to move on. But as Minori Kawa began to head down the passageway, the blue cat hurried to bar his path. Wait, wait, wait up. You don't need to be in such a hurry. Have yourself a little rest before you go. Sorry, but I don't have time to dilly-dally. It doesn't need to be for very long. No, I'm heading off. The blue cat frowned in consternation. You really shouldn't rush so much. It's bad for your health. With a flurry of paw swipes, the cat wiped its signboard clear. Then it scurried away, scowling back resentfully at Minorikawa as it went. Minorikawa followed in the same direction. And naturally, there was a ladder. Minorikawa headed down as a matter of course. At the bottom of the absurdly long ladder was, as expected, another long, narrow passageway. No longer harboring any thought of turning back, Minorikawa pressed onward. After a while, he reached another T, a choice of left and right again. A breeze was blowing from the passageway to the right. Minorikawa went... What the fuck is this shit? Cannot open the time chart during this scenario! That's a unified B from the chat. Ah, you're back again. He'd arrived at yet another room, and the red cat stood there, panting heavily. Minori Kawa read the words written on its sign. I live in Africa. Huh. No need to worry. The red cat only ever tells the truth. You seem to be in pretty bad shape, though. <laughs> the cat broke out in a little coughing fit. Well, anyway, Norikawa said, guess I'd better move along. But as he began to head down the passageway, the red cat hurried to bar his path. What is it? Oh, nothing in particular. Could you please get out of my way, then? How come? Uh, because I need to keep going? Where are you going? Onward from here! Oh, I see. The red cat frowned and clicked its tongue. Did you just click your tongue at me? Of course not. The red cat turned and hurried away, coughing intermittently and shooting resentful looks over its shoulder as it went. Minori Kawa followed in the same direction. There was yet another hole in the floor. Sick of having to deal with this. <laughs> Norikawa just jumped straight down. <laughs> he just... <laughs> Sick of dealing with bladders, he just jumped. He landed with an elegant flourish like a gymnast finishing a routine. He had to have fallen a few dozen meters. After some distance, he arrived at a four-way intersection. Minori Kawa could hear feline mewling coming from the passageways to the left and right. He went to the right, straight ahead, to the left. <sighs> Why is everyone so united on A? He soon came to a small room, and found the blue cat there. Read closely, written here is the truth. Minori Kawa looked at the sign. I'm sorry, just what the heck is this? It's the truth. Doraemon Janaika. This is? That's right. Okay, but I have no clue what it's supposed to mean. 
Stop your yapping and just note it down. Minorikawa did as he was told, copying the crude sketch onto the palm of his hand. Hold it right there, Buster, the blue cat snapped. What's the deal with that scribble? Scribble? Don't you go drawing garbage like that. Not after I've gone to such effort to share the truth with you. Hey, I just drew the same thing you've got drawn on there, Minorikawa replied. Don't give me that, you punk. Look closer. You'll see that right here I've... Oh, whoops. The blue cat quickly withdrew to a dark corner of the room and began erasing the picture on the board. Yikes, this is something I just scribbled down to kill some time earlier. Give me a sec. Minorikawa waited while the blue cat sat down to write its message. It spoke each letter aloud as it wrote, making the whole process rather slow. Finally, the cat sprang back to its feet. Now read this. I don't have hair. That's the truth. You got that, yeah? Yeah, sure. Make sure to note that down now. Minorikawa jotted the words on his palm. Oh, and don't let yourself get tricked by the red cat. See ya. The blue cat vanished down the passageway. Minorikawa forged on ahead. There was a hole in the floor, so Minorikawa dived through it. After falling for the better part of a minute, he landed on the floor below and set off briskly down the corridor that stretched before him. Hey, looks like you finally made it. It was a brown cat who greeted him at the next room. Congratulations. It bowed repeatedly in satisfaction. Oh, I made it through already? That was easier than I expected. The cat let out an amused snort. Its long whiskers bobbed about gracefully. Now then, based on the hints you've gathered, you need to answer my final questions. Are you ready? Sure thing. Once you've given me an answer, you can't change it. Alright? And there's only one correct answer. Only one. Are you ready? Given the hints from the Honest Cat, where's the answer to the question, who am I? Eh? Do not forward through these choices on this next question. What do you mean, don't forward through them? Once you scroll to B, you can't scroll back to A. Not a lion. Corn? Oh my god, you really can't scroll back up. Corn? Corn is not round. Corn's kinda round. No, I think it's corn, man. Okay, fine, it's not corn. A newspaper? Newspapers don't have whiskers.
Othello pieces. Othello piece. But what are the other choices? <laughs> I want to know! But old fellow piece sounds right! Like, it's round, it's not got hair, it's not African. It's also not Doraemon, so like that's also a point in its favor. We will answer Othello. Who is the honest one? I'll give you ten seconds to think about it. Excuse me? Go? Eh? 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 Green! Blue! Blue! <laughs> what the fuck is that? <laughs> Time limits! <laughs> I'm scared! <laughs> Please make your way inside! Norikawa headed down the corridor! <laughs> Chat kind of did that for me, but like, what? He found himself facing a grimy door. There was no other way to continue. But I want bad endings. Here goes, he thought. He drew his leg back and gave the door a hearty kick. This can't be the right fucking way for the plot to progress anyway. Why do I care? <laughs> eh? The mob of young men inside the bar turned as one, of, as one at the sound of the door crashing open. Who the hell are you? Several of them started toward him belligerently. Would you just, call you with it? Hmm? just calm down and hear me out, he said. I've come to interview you. Interview us? What the hell for? These were hot-headed punks, all right. They seemed to be itching for a confrontation. The Norikawa felt like a punch might come flying his way at any moment. Then another voice called out from further back. Hold up, guys. Can I access the time chart now? <laughs> it's just... What was the point of this? What was the purpose of this? What was that bullshit? There was no purpose to that. It just exists. It didn't. It didn't mean anything. It. It meant nothing. It was just there. Right. This is the worst game I've ever played. The worst one. Zero out of ten. We're playing pop and music. Oh God! I'm gonna fall out my chair. No, let's get back to it. <laughs> I'm Red Cat. It was a young man seated in the far back corner of the bar. His air of authority marked him as the gang's leader. That must be Susumu then, Minorikawa thought. When you say interview, do you mean for TV or like a magazine? Mind telling us who you are? 
The name's Minori Kawa. I'm a freelance journalist. I'm doing a magazine piece about young people in Shibuya. All I'm asking is for you guys to answer a few questions. Here lies the answer to the science quiz from last time. Methane! Methane has been tapped as a potential new energy source to replace fossil fuels or atomic power, but there are concerns about its tendency to exacerbate the global warming process. It is extremely flammable. The methane produced by food waste has been known to cause garbage trucks to catch fire. Huh. So Sumu sounded less than enthused. Just five minutes, Monolikawa said. What do you say? Nah, I'm not in the best of moods right now. Go on, get out of here. Right, Minorikawa thought. He's going to make things difficult. But he hadn't expected these troublemakers to just up and accept an offer to appear in print. Now was when the real battle would begin. Guess I'll just have to write my piece without your help then. Susumu took the bait and shot him a look. Right about what exactly? Your little warehouse raids. Warehouse raids? Susumu raised an eyebrow. What are you talking about? Really now, you're going to tell me you don't know your boys are dealing in stolen goods? SOS doesn't steal, man. You don't know what the hell you're talking about. Oh yeah? Why don't you ask those two over there? He'd spotted the two fellows he'd seen arguing earlier, at the scene of the explosion. Now he pointed them out. Their faces betrayed their alarm. Susumu glared at them. Is this true? They averted their eyes and said nothing. I asked you a question. Have you been stealing stuff? After a long moment of surly hesitation, both young men nodded. You idiots! Susumu marched up to the two and without warning decked them both. How dare you sully the SOS name! As the two gang members cowered, he continued to punch them repeatedly. Okay, enough with the beatdown! Minori Kawa stepped in to intervene. My arm still is a bit tender from me fucking it up two days ago. Let's get down to business here. I won't reveal anything about the warehouse raids. In exchange, you give me my interview. How's that? Not a bad deal, I'd say. Use other arm. Oh yeah? Well, oh look, I punched my microphone. See? That's what happens when I use other arm. Fucking genius. Fucking... Oh, look at me. I have big brain. I have two arms. Mm. Dickhead. But Susumu ignored him, continuing his pummeling of the pair. Well, hey, nobody's gonna play nice with the guy who flies off the handle and beats on people, you know. What'd you just say? Well, look at yourself. You're clearly not the cream of the crop here, kid. At that, Susumu's fists finally fell steel. Fell steel. Fell <laughs> Poppin'! The rowdy bar went completely silent. Say that one more time. I dare you. <laughs> I'll put your ass in the ground. The gang's leader eye the gang leader's eyes were red with rage. Minori Kawa snorted, unafraid. Hmm. <laughs> That's the exact sort of line I'd expect from a total wuss who's all bark and no bite. Shut your damn mouth. Get the hell out of here. Oh, this is hilarious. SOS's top dog is such a yappy little puppy. Susumu snarled like an animal. You son of a bitch. I'm gonna beat your ass. Mr. Mino, I'm all finished. An ebullient voice resounded suddenly throughout the bar. I don't think I said that properly. Cheerful and full of energy. Originally, the term indicated a state of bubbling or boiling, so it's effectively a fancy way of describing someone as bubbly. I'm learning so many new words from Shibuya Scrumble. Chiaki? Minori Kawa looked and saw that both she and Katayama had appeared in the doorway. I finished my copy. Could you please look it over for me? She thrust out her laptop proudly. Susumu stared in bewilderment. Who the hell are you? Oh, um, I was under the impression you SRS folks were, uh, being interviewed? Chiaki broke off haltingly. Yeah, you're right about that. One by one, gang members started to close in around her. Well, it's just... You look like you're really angry, is all. Oh, do we now? That's because we are pretty damn angry. Good grief, Katayama groaned. It would seem that getting your interview is quite impossible. By the way, you only have another- You shut up! Minori Kawa snapped as Kadayama appeared at his watch. Just leave this to me. You two hurry up and get out of here. No way, Chiaki said. What? Why not? Because I want you to read my copy, Mr. Mino. 
She looked him right in the eye. <laughs> you really want to read the copy, huh? I need a wheel again. Why does everyone want this to read her copy? We ain't we don't have time for the copy. We don't have time for copy. Like he didn't have much of a choice. He postponed the interview to read over Chiaki's copy. Alright, he said. Let me see your laptop. He held out his hand and started to make his way over to her. Whoa! Before he could reach her though, the SOS punks had Chiaki and Karayama surrounded. Ooh, what's this? Something important? One of the gang members reached out to grab Chiaki's computer. Knock it off! Don't touch that! She struggled to resist. Leave the girl alone, you scumbags! Minorikawa barked. The young men in the bar stopped and turned. Susumu was quick to respond. Screw you, man! Who are you calling scumbags here? Any guy who raises a hand to a lady is a scumbag. If you're looking for a fight, you can fight me. Just get your hands off the girl! Minorikawa did his best to look unafraid as a couple dozen vicious gazers now turned back on him. Ring it on, Susumu said. Hey, someone go stand and look at out front. He snapped his fingers sharply. Get him. At the signal, Susumu's men quickly closed in on Minorikawa. Oh, okay, bye. It was like being caught up in a tsunami. He took a hard punch to the face, and his vision went blurry. Before he could react, he was hit again, twice, thrice, with punches and kicks. The moment his first assailant paused, another joined the assault. Four blows, five blows, six. Minorikawa lost count somewhere around thirty. A metallic taste filled his mouth, and he could feel his consciousness fading. All the strength was being battered from his body. He couldn't even tell if he was standing on his feet or lying on his back. Then finally, he felt himself crumpled to the floor. Even then, the beating did not let up. As he arrived helplessly, the young men kicked him in the gut over and over. Stop it, he heard Chiaki shriek. You're going to kill him! Eventually, Minorikawa forced himself to go limp. Finally, the kicking stopped. Ah, oh, crap, one of the thugs muttered, sounding panicky. Did we take this a bit too far? Mr. Mino! Chiaki rushed to Minorikawa's side, sobbing. Please, she cried out. Answer me! He held his breath and said nothing. Mr. Mino! Tears streaked down her cheeks. She shook him desperately. Don't worry. He gasped out at last, holding up a hand to stave her off. She let out a yelp of surprise, staring at his battered face. He could feel blood trickling from the corner of his mouth. He turned his grisly visage on the gang members as he painfully rose to his feet. <laughs> Abruptly, Minorikawa broke into peals of mocking laughter. Um, Mr. Mino? Chiaki stared at him, aghast. 
<laughs> he only laughed the harder. It seems he took a few too many blows to the head. The poor thing. Katayama averted his eyes, unable to watch. <laughs> Minorikawa shot out an accusing finger at the crowd. Looks like I win this round. Uh, what? Susumu blinked, dumbstruck. Don't you get it? Minorikawa said thickly around his bruised tongue. What I am saying, you're a bunch of idiots. Now then, if you'll pardon me. Oh, I get it. Minori Kawa was halfway to the exit when Kadayama's exclamation rang out. You were planning all along to let these guys beat you up, huh? Minori Kawa joked to his Hulk, his shoulders trembling. I like eating ice cream. Thank you, Quasarain, for that deep insight into the human condition. I would counter that with... Same. Thank you for the bits, Quasarain. You knew they'd turn down the interview, and so by letting yourself get beat up, you'd have something to put in an article, yeah? It's a bit bogus, maybe, but I guess it's one way to get material to fill your pages. Inorikawa broke out into a cold sweat. Shut up, you idiot! But Katayama continued with his oh-so-brilliant analysis. You sure pulled a fast one on this gang here. I wonder what sort of headline your piece should have. Twilight of Shibuya's legendary street crew, former vigilante squad, now mere gang of common thugs. Something like that, maybe? Susumu stared daggers at Minorikawa. Go on, I dare you to write that up. Then we really will put your ass in the ground. He moved to block the path to the door, clutching a broken beer bottle in one hand. You moron! Minorikawa bellowed at Kadayama. I was this close to pulling it off! Ah, well that's a shame, isn't it? Kadayama replied. Minorikawa rolled his eyes. Gee, you think? Susumu slowly advanced on them, beer bottle at the ready. Incidentally, Katayama said, You have 40 minutes and 7 seconds left. Good luck. Minorikawa hung his head. Was everything futile at this point? I can't tab. Hopeless, pointless, ineffectual. Not to be confused with feudal, which refers to the socio-political system of the Middle Ages involving lords and vassals and fiefdoms. Fiefdoms? <laughs> Alright, cool your jets. I'd say that's quite enough. Susumu stopped and spun around. Kimizuka had entered the bar. The taxi driver stared out sternly from behind his sunglasses. All the young men in the bar fell silent. Minori Kara and his companions exchanged glances. Ah, oh, man, you? Susumu's face twisted up in awkward embarrassment. Kimizuka's tone was light and playful. Who says that word, Rig? Fuck off. But intimidating nevertheless. Whoa, hey now. That's no way to address your teacher. Teacher? Minorikawa blurted in disbelief. Kimizuka nodded. Yeah, until last year, I used to be a teacher. But I got into a bit of a dispute with my school, so I moved on. These guys in here are all former students of mine. Sorry that they're such a bunch of good-for-nothings. Wow, Chiaki said. I'd have never guessed. I thought, since I wasn't their teacher anymore, it wasn't my place to butt in. But I couldn't sit idly by and let one of my customers take a beating. Kimizuka turned back to Susumu. This guy totally played you. Every last one of you. Susumu bit his lip in frustration. Still, it's hard to imagine anyone would want to take a beating from this many guys all at once. So it's hardly your fault for falling for it. Kimizuka had switched gears from taxi driver to street smart mentor. You guys lost this one, he said. And for that, you need to give him his interview. No way, Susumu looked disgusted. Look here, kid, Kimizuka said. Let yourself save some face and help the man out. And maybe you won't come off as a bunch of total idiots in his article. He flashed an amicable grin. Well, when you put it that way, fine, all right. Susumu blew out his breath in resignation. Susumu, you can't just let yourself cave like that. The remark had come from a particularly nasty looking fellow who slouched on the bar sofa. Minori Kara recognized him, a 
the kid he'd encountered earlier that afternoon, wandering around with a wooden cudgel. You shut up, Kiryu, Susumu said. So what, you're just gonna let SOS make a mockery of itself? Kiryu demanded. The gang leader let out an annoyed growl, but said nothing. And you still think you've got what it takes to run Shibuya? Shut up! I've already said I'll do it. Kiryu sneered sullenly at Susumu's outburst. Mr. Mino! Minori Kawa was just letting out a sigh of relief for being able to get his interview when Chiaki scurried back up to him. Please, can you read my copy now? Her face showed a strange mixture of confidence and unease. Alright, he said resignedly. Let me see it. The proofing deadline was drawing steadily nearer. Still, if the piece wasn't good enough, he'd have to make her rewrite it again. He wasn't going to compromise on quality. Bracing himself, Minori Kawa stared at the monitor. Chiaki swallowed hard, so anxious that it was audible. Minorikawa gave the piece a fast once-over, then read it again more closely. When he was done, he closed his eyes, considering. Chiaki held her breath, waiting for his response. It's okay. She looked black at, uh, black at him. Amazing. She looked back at him blankly for a long moment. Really? It's really okay. Is it really, really okay? It really is really, really okay. Minori Kawa watched in surprise as she broke down in tears. Oh, thank you so much! Chiaki bowed profusely. He gave her an affectionate little ruffle atop her head. She wiped at her face with her palms, scrubbing the tears away. Um, so I guess I never really told you. What sort of articles I want to write and all. No, I don't think you have. Well, I mean, I want to write socially conscious exposés like you do, Mr. Mino. And so, to hear you say that an article I wrote is okay, that makes me really... I mean, happy, I guess? Or maybe moved? Her eyes were still bright with emotion. Well then, really? There was actually another writer who took inspiration from his work, and who strove to be like him. Minori Kawa had never thought a day like this would come. It was a peculiar feeling. He'd always been the follower, chasing after interviews in order to be more like Toyama. It made him feel both bashful and proud that the skill and soul he'd honed might be passed on to the next generation. Right, I should be off. Kimizuka gave Minori Kawa a slight nod. Minori Kawa returned the gesture, but more deeply. You really have been a tremendous help today. I'm not sure where I'd even be right now if you hadn't been there for me. Oh no, not at all. I was just driving a customer around to where he asked me to go. Oh, that's right. I still owe you a fare. Opening his wallet, Minori Kawa saw he only had a 10,000 yen bill. Still, now was no time to be frugal. Keep the change, he said as he handed it over. But even as he said it, Kimizuka was already handing him some money back. Here, I insist. The driver had already counted out the exact change in advance. You really are a pro, huh? Norikawa took the money and stuffed it into his pocket. We'll meet again, somewhere out there on the streets of Shibuya. Kimizuka pointed his index finger at Minorikawa's face. Minorikawa responded in kind. After that, the interview with SOS went off without a hitch. Now that the tension was diffused, these were just a bunch of ordinary young guys. The juxtaposition of their appearance and their behavior would make for an interesting piece. So about what you said earlier, Susumu said once Minorikawa had finished his questioning. About how I'm not the cream of the crop. Ah yeah, that. I just said it to get you worked up. Don't worry about it. Well, let me just ask you what you really think then. How do you think I could be a better leader? I don't know. I'm not really the sort of guy who wants to stand at the top, you know? But I guess I can tell you two things that'll make things go more smoothly with you and your buddies. Susumu leaned in, listening intently. Forgiveness, and also trust. Minorikawa chewed over his own words. The events of the day replayed in the back of his mind. He'd forgiven Toyama for his fake suicide, and trusted that he'd regain his reporter's edge. He'd forgiven Chiaki for her bungled interviews, and trusted that she'd grow as a journalist. 
In the end, that's what it was that had helped him through. Forgiveness followed by trust. Susanoo grumbled softly. Forgiveness and trust, huh? Doesn't sound so easy. People gravitate towards somebody who can handle things when they get tough. With that, Minorikawa got to his feet. Now we've got all the articles we need covered. Jackie rushed over to his side. Well, I guess we still need Mr. Toyama's piece. I just got off the phone with my office, Katayama said casually. It seems they've already received the data from him. Whoa, what? I guess he really can get the job done when he applies himself. Minori Kawa felt an inner surge of pride. Now then, he indicated Katayama. How much time do we have left? 30 minutes remaining, Katayama replied, eyeing his watch. 30 minutes, huh? Looks like we might make it after all. Chiaki, laptop. Right. With a beaming grin, Chiaki held out her computer. Minorikawa got ready to start typing, but then a young man barged into the bar. Oh, it's Archie Endo. He's come to ask the members of SOS to help with the planned operation down at the scramble. The newcomer hurried over to where Susumu was sitting and promptly prostrated himself on the floor. Whatever this was about, it looked like a big deal. Who was this kid? The gang's feelings looked decidedly mixed. I need people to bring a guy down. I'm here to ask for your help. I know I have no right to ask you this, but please, I really need your help. As Minori Kawa listened to the young man's conversation with Susumu, he could feel his blood start pumping. It sounded like they were talking about the terrorist plot in which Shibuya had become embroiled. Hey, Chiaki? He said quietly. Did you hear that just now? I did! I'm not sure I follow all of it, but it definitely has the whiff of a major scoop. Minorikawa shot her a daring grin. So what's the play here, Chiaki? We interview him, of course. But we only have 30 minutes left, right? So we take 10 minutes for our conversation, and use the remaining 20 to write up the piece. I'll help you out. You learned good, kiddo. Minorikawa ruffled Chiaki's hair again. They both blushed profusely, gripped by a surge of excitement. Why are you doing this? I can't make any sense of it whatsoever. Katayama stood peering at them skeptically. If you write up the piece you just did your interview for, you'll make your deadline. Why go out of your way to trouble yourself further? It's no trouble, Minorikawa said. I'm just doing what a professional does. That's all. Katayama let out a solemn sigh. Good grief. He looked at his pocket watch again, then snapped it shut. Well, if you aren't concerned about the time, then do as you like, I suppose. I'll admit you've made me quite curious to read this magazine we're putting together. Minori Kara and Chiaki rolled their eyes as they turned away. Already they were making their way over to Susumu and his gang. The interviews aren't over until you have what you need. You refuse to let them be over. You spend every last second you have to do the best job you can. That's what being a professional journalist is all about. And also writing your articles on no time whatsoever. Minori Kawa cracked his knuckles and stepped between the two young men. Sounds like you've got an interesting story. Mind letting me hear it too? End! What about the jump? <laughs> ah, not yet. Well, actually, still locked, so I guess Kano is the only option from here.
It's become linear. Bullshit. Kano's cell phone rang. He saw Kuze's name on the display. Kano speaking. What the hell are you doing? The director's voice was shrill with irritation. What's the situation with Maria Osawa? I have her in custody, sir. You need to get her into quarantine immediately. I'll send a counter-NBC terrorism unit to pick her up. A public safety mobile investigation unit belonging to the Tokyo Metropolitan... Metropolitan... I fucking hate that word. Metropolitan... Metropolitan. I can't do it. I can't. I can't do it, though. No. No. It's ass, man. It's impossible. The Tokyo Fifth Police Department Public Security Bureau. The acronym NBC refers to nuclear, biological, and chemical threats. The unit not only gathers information and investigates terror incidents that make use of these means, but also deploys deploy. <laughs> I want to die. But also deploys relief and safety restoration measures. I'm the worst motherfucker to ever read a visual novel. What's your location, sir? The situation is a little complicated at the moment. Kano replied. He and Stanley made eye contact. Kano gave him a knowing nod. He knew what he needed to do here. Fiefdom! 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 Oh no, I'm out of mints. No, I'm not. He briefly informed Kuze of the plan to take Maria to the laboratory, but was careful not to mention Alfred. Please, sir, Kano said, bowing reflexively to the phone. Let me handle this. Absolutely not, Kuze exclaimed. There's no way I can allow that. Maria Osawa needs to go in quarantine right now. The act of placing infectees in isolation, such as in a medical treatment facility, in order to prevent the spread of infection. The virus is capable of airborne transmission, an airborne infection isolation room is sometimes used, which employs negative air pressure to ensure that air from within the room does not leak outside. Sir, please, just give us a little more time. Giving her the antiviral is the only way we can save her. If you put her in quarantine, it'll be a death sentence. Kuze let out a growl of frustration. Kano, that isn't your decision to make. Kano had run out of arguments. It was clear that Kuze's only concern was stopping the spread of the virus. Director Kuze, are you just going to let Maria Osawa die? We can't put the lives of everyone in Shibuya at risk in order to save a single person. I know that, sir. That's why I'm asking you to please let me go to that laboratory. And if it looks like we're not going to be able to hack the password, then at that point a quarantine can- Kano! Kuze snapped. I'm giving you an order. And I'm not accepting that order. Listen, Kuze said. How many years have you been a cop? What do you mean by that, sir? Kuze didn't reply. Is this an order from up top? What's going on here, sir? Please, I need some kind of explanation. Stop it, Kuze said. You sound like a child. This is dereliction of duty. Call me a child if you want, but I'm not following an order that I know isn't right. Kano punched the end call button with his thumb. From an objective standpoint, maybe Kuze was right. They needed to think about more than just Maria. If the Uwa virus spread through Shibuya, it would be a nightmare of epic proportions. Kano understood that perfectly clearly. But still, he looked down at Maria's face as she lay collapsed on the floor. This girl was still alive, and Kano couldn't stand idly by and let a living, breathing person die. Consequences be damned, he wasn't going to be the one to weigh the worth of someone's life. As he stood, still clutching his cell phone, Stanley gently set a hand on his shoulder. You did fine, he said quietly. Alfred is in possession of the Ua virus. The people of Shibuya are already in danger. He may, or have, he may have already released the virus in the city. If he hasn't, he may do so at any time. Right now, what we need to do is get that antiviral and arrest Alfred. You made the right choice here. Thanks, Stanley. I appreciate hearing that. Stanley gave Kano a slap on the back. He was right. At this point, they needed to focus on the things they could still accomplish. So guys, I actually stepped forward. Who's going to take Katomi's sister and Kanan to the lab? Maria was in no condition to walk, so they were going to have to take a car, which meant they needed a driver. I only have a motorcycle license, as she said, and I don't know where the lab is anyhow. I should go with Maria alone. Kanan looked over at the others. There's no way of knowing for sure when she might become contagious. We shouldn't needlessly risk exposing more people to infection. She knelt down to gather Maria in her arms. 
In that case, I should drive. Kind of whirled around at the sound of a new voice behind him. Katano was standing in the doorway. You! Achi's face went red with rage. Yeet! Okay, but unyeet. Reverse yeet. Never mind then. Reheated. You, Achi snarled. In the doorway stood the man with the cane. Detective Tatano. Tatano. Kano and Daisuke spoke simultaneously. Now at last, Achi had a name for the assassin. It was a name he felt he'd heard somewhere before. You son of a bitch, Achi roared. What the hell are you doing here? Tatano bowed his head profusely. I am truly sorry. You're sorry? Sorry don't cut it, man. Not after what you were trying to do hit to Hitomi. I don't expect you to forgive me, and I intend to turn myself in to be punished for my crimes. But before I do that, please let me do what I can to help you. I think you've helped enough. I actually grabbed Tatano by the collar and drew back his fist. Kano moved to stop him, but Tatano held up a hand. No, it's alright. Let him do as he pleases. There was no trace of the menacing expression the man had worn in their previous encounters. <laughs> Achi scowled but lowered his fist, then released his hold on Tatano's collar. Fine. Hitomi's sister needs help, so we do need a driver right now. Make sure those two get to the lab and back safely. That'll make up for that punch I didn't give you just now. Thank you. I am so sorry. Daisuke stepped forward. No, I'm the one who should be apologizing. I'm the one who got you caught up in this. Daisuke, we really didn't grow up to be very good people, did we? No, guess not. The two men stared bleakly at each other, shoulders slumped. In the end, Tatano said, I guess we were just trying to run away from our pain. Yeah, didn't expect my own son to be the one to teach me that. I just turned out to be a fine young man. He is Kotane's boy, after all. Guys! Achi stepped into the middle of their solemn heart-to-heart. -heart. You can get sappy all you want later. Dad, once this is all over, we're going to see Suzune, okay? Sure. Daisuke nodded heartily. Hold on, Kano spoke up, turning to Stanley. If these two take Maria to the lab, that leaves us- That leaves just us two to apprehend Alfred down at the scramble. Is that going to be enough? I mean, Alpha's not going to shop without a plan. The more people we have on our side, the better. And I doubt we'll be able to get any help from the police. Good point, Stanley agreed. Hey, Nachi said. I'm here too, and I'm going with you. I'll keep Hitomi safe. Oh look, good news, Kano. Now we have three people. Stanley let out a sardonic laugh. Kano frowned. Actually, I appreciate the offer, but having three people instead of two won't make much of a difference. When you're not sure of the enemy's exact plan, you really need strength in numbers. If you could set up a dragnet like the task force did this morning, that'd be ideal, but... Come on, detective, Nachi said. Don't you have any idea what sort of approach this psycho might take? If I were Alfred, Kano mused, then I suppose my biggest problem would be figuring out how to get away after I'd taken Hitomi's blood. Stanley nodded in agreement. I'm betting he plans to involve the Ua virus, he said. If, for instance, he tells us he set up a device somewhere to spread the virus throughout Shibuya, 
That prevents us from taking action against him. Achi swallowed hard. This guy wanted to unleash a killer virus in Shibuya? If he succeeded in the town Achi had known and loved all his life would become a graveyard. Of course, that's mere conjecture, Stanley murmured. Quite frankly, even I can only guess what he's going to do. His expression was grim. Strength in numbers, huh? So you're saying we absolutely need more people, is that it? Essentially, yes, Stanley replied. But not just anyone, mind. If it's not a group that meshes well, it'll hinder more than help. Kano folded his arms across his chest. He looked perplexed. People who mesh well together, huh? Archie had an idea. <laughs> well, I think we know the correct choice here. Or do we know the correct choice? I don't know. <laughs> like, we know B is the thing that occurs in Minori Kawa's end, but what happens if he goes to the police for backup and then... <laughs> <laughs> what? Do, Minori Kawa's path has to change at that point. Inquiring minds need to know. They could ask the police for backup. It might be a long shot, but it was their only move. Ah, oh, this is a fake news, isn't it? He hurriedly suggested that, but Kano just shook his head apologetically. Unfortunately, there's nobody on the force who'll help us. Well, isn't there anything you can do about that? I'd hope that Director Kuze would understand, but... Kano hung his head. Were they out of options then? No, there was still one last thing they could try. Yeah, this, is, this was a fake news choice, unbelievable. He knew the gang might see it as a selfish request, though. Susumu would probably be furious with him, but Achi would just have to deal with that. Even if his old pals wouldn't forgive him, if they understood that they'd be helping protect Shibuya, he was sure they'd step up and take action. After all, the whole point of the gang was that it was made up of people who loved their town. Can you give me a half hour? I'm gonna try to see if I can rustle up some people. Kind of straightened himself up. You think you can do it? Actually nodded assertively. Just wait here for me, okay? He said to Hitomi. She gave him a worried smile. Alright, I'll be waiting. It'll be okay. Actually did his best to sound reassuring. I promise I'll bring back some help. Royal Elastics. He knew where he needed to go, the pool hall in Uraharajuku that was his old gang's main hangout. Running at top speed, he could probably make it in about 10 minutes, but he'd need another 9 to get through the labyrinth. Alright! Rushing out the door with a battle cry loud enough for Kano and the others to hear from back inside the shop, Anchi sped on his way. I'll do the jump later. Hey, Zambiru. Traffic on Dogenzaka was at a near standstill. Had there been some sort of major accident? As Achi ran alongside the as, as ran along the roadside, he heard a middle-aged man screaming angrily. You've got to be kidding me! What do you mean no trains are stopping at Shibuya? The guy was red in the face. Ah. Ah. Two B's and two A's, we're at a tie here. What the fuck? Make up your mind, chat. You see okay, that's 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 a tiebreaker for B. Calm down, old man. Actually ignored him and kept on running. Finally, he arrived at SOS's hideout. Two young men were standing by the door as lookouts. Ashi recognized one of them. It was the kid whose so-called buddies had tried to shake him down earlier that afternoon. They roused themselves as Ashi approached. Hey, I need to see Susumu. No can do, he's in the middle of something right now. The lookouts made no move to let him through. Ashi felt a surge of resentment towards Susumu. 
if he'd still been with SOS, he'd never try to post members on guard duty like they were low-ranking Yakuza thugs. Do we press or do we use force? So many choices. So little time. That's three B's and an A. A clear consensus emerges. Fine. Then I guess I have to do this the hard way. Actually forcibly shove the two of them aside. But the two recovered quickly. Before he could get in the door, they grabbed hold of him and pushed him away. Look, I don't have time to screw around. Just go and tell Susumu that Archie's here. At the mention of his name, the two lookouts exchanged wary glances. Alright, I'll go ask him. One of the lookouts headed inside, leaving Archie alone with the kid he'd helped out earlier. Do they always stick you on guard duty? The boy didn't reply. Back when I ran with SOS, we never needed anyone on lookout. We were just a bunch of guys who loved Shibuya, and who had a fun time hanging out with each other. That's all it was, really. It's not Susumu's fault that SOS changed, the boy said, somewhat fearfully. Lately, it's Kiryu who's been driving things. Kiryu? Oh yeah, that guy. Archie recalled his earlier run-in with him. The guy was an arrogant bully. Kiryu was planning to steal Susumu's throne. What for? The boy took a nervous look at the door before hurriedly continuing. He's trying to expand SOS's influence. And he's got a lot of people on his side. Right now, the gang is kind of split into two factions. Susumu's guys and Kiryu's guys. Finally, Achi understood what was going on. The gang members had all been acting so weird because they were caught up in some kind of internal struggle. Kiryu goes around recruiting new followers by force. And if he doesn't like you, he dishes out punishment. This month alone, he sent eight people to the hospital. SOS is a total mess, man. This plan of mine might not work after all. Archie felt a sinking sense of despair. If SOS was ravaged with infighting, it was doubtful they'd heed the dangerous request he had for them. But even still, I... I want to be a part of this gang, the boy muttered. Actually peered at him in surprise. Why? They shake you down for dues, stick you on guard duty? That's not a decent way to treat someone. I look up to Susumu. He treats me like he would anyone else, even though I'm way down at the bottom. And it's not just me. Susumu always puts the members of the gang before himself. That's why I want to stick with SOS. Naha. So that's it, huh? Susumu really had been trying his best. And the members of SOS, some of them at least, admired him for it and stuck by him. Thanks, Hachi said. The kid gave him a dubious look. Hachi didn't know if Susumu would help him out or not, but he knew it was still worth putting their disagreements aside in order to ask. The door opened, and the other lookout returned. Susumu says to come on in. Achi nodded and strode inside. Oh, owned again. Hey, young chads. The scent of alcohol and cigarettes washed over him. Susumu sat on the sofa at the far end of the bar. He was where Achi used to sit back in the day. What do you want? Susumu asked immediately. Achi walked up to him and then got down on his hands and knees. Huh? What are you doing down there? The hell is this all about? I need people to bring a guy down. I'm here to ask for your help. The crowd around him flew into an uproar. Peals of mocking laughter rang in Archie's ears. I know I have no right to ask you this, but please, I really need your help. Just some guy, huh? Who? 
He's an international terrorist trying to get his hands on some wonder drug for a killer virus. If you don't catch him, somebody I know is going to die. And that's not all. He might try to unleash the killer virus here in the city. Susumu burst out laughing. This is some kind of joke? You are right in the head there, Achi? The other gang members followed his lead, unleashing another storm of mockery. The laughter continued for quite some time. I wonder if I'll have time to finish off this block. 2 A's and a B. Finally, Archie had had enough. Shut your damn mouths! He roared loud enough to quash the merriment echoing through the bar. Are you going to help me or not? Just give me your answer. He stared Susumu right in the eye. Susumu leaned in close, peering down into Achi's face. Is that how you go about asking someone a favor? Susumu growled menacingly. If you have a problem with me kowtowing like this, I can apologize some other way, all you want. But don't you care that I just told you Shibuya is in danger? Achi's voice was unwavering. But face it, Susumu. Isn't Shibuya the reason everyone here hangs out with each other? If you're telling me you don't want to keep our town safe, then I won't ask you guys for, any th for anything again. I withdraw my request. The two glared into each other's eyes. Then, before Susumu could reply, an odd man stepped in between them. Okay, but why would I do that? Sounds like you've got an interesting story, he said. Mind letting me hear it too? You again? Didn't you already get your interview? Susumu rolled his eyes. I think Grovels here might be telling the truth. The newcomer's face was all seriousness. It lines up with the information I have. Hey Grovels, you got a second? My name's not Grovels, Achi growled. It's Achi. I'm Minoru Minorikawa, magazine reporter. And I know a bit about that stuff you were saying just now. The killer virus you mentioned is called the Ua virus. That wonder drug is an antiviral medication, and that person you know who might die is Maria Osawa. Am I right? Archie was almost too shocked for words. How... how do you know all that? The Norikawa ignored him and turned to the SOS leader. Susumu, he said. Something really is going down in Shibuya. What are you going to do about it, boss? Susumu bit his lip. He looked pretty conflicted. Sounds good to me, someone called out. Let's give him a hand. Actually turned to see where the voice had come from. It was Kiryu. You shut up, Susumu said with a glare. Break out of your rut, old man, Kiryu sneered. Actually here is right. Isn't keeping our beloved Shibuya safe what SOS does? He slipped an arm around Achi's shoulders. You're okay with that, right, Achi? Me going against Susumu's orders to help you out? Kiryu's lips pulled back in a broad, unsettling grin. But first, we have unfinished business, you and I. I mean, I'm willing to lend a hand even though you ditched the gang and all. But first, we've got to settle our score, here and now. You understand, don't you? Yeah, you're right. Kiryu grinned hungrily. It's guillotine time! A bunch of the gang members started up an eager clamor at Kiryu's pronouncement. In a matter of moments, Archie was grabbed from all sides and hoisted up onto a pool table. A dozen young men held down his arms and legs, positioning him so his head jutted out past the table's edge. Kiryu brought out a steel pipe nearly a meter long. He was caked liberally with dried blood. Guillotine! 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 The men of Kiryu's faction pumped their fists in the air, chanting madly. Kiryu licked his lips as if drunk off their cheers. Glancing to one side, Achi saw Minori Kawa speaking emphatically to Susumu. It looked like the reporter was trying to talk some sense into the SOS leader. Man, today is my lucky day. I get to take the head of SOS's original head. Achi twisted his neck to peer up at him. Man, what point is there in taking my head right now? Oh my my my, you don't get it, do you? 
See, if I send you to the hospital, everyone in Shibuya is going to know my name. And once I've got that big-ass sign over my head, I'll be able to unite this town under my banner in one fell swoop. Kiryu's eyes were crazed and bloodshot. Then that's all the more reason for you to do as I'm asking. If you want to unite Shibuya, you have to protect it first. But if you think you need to take my head to do that, then go right ahead. Even if these guys rule like Kiryu, if this many of them actually showed up at the scramble, they'd be able to do far more than Achi could hope to do by himself. The ultimate goal was to capture Alfred. Ashi didn't care how they made that happen. He was just sorry he wouldn't get to see it through, to protect Hitomi to the very end. Okay then, Kiryu brayed. The gloves are coming off. Oh baby. Yo, this is fucked! Ah, I don't like it! <laughs> Go on. Do it. Achi braced himself. Just make sure you keep your promise. Kiryu raised the steel pipe high above his head. And then, before he brought it down, he flicked the tip of his tongue from his mouth like a snake. You dumbass. I didn't promise you nothing. Nachi strained in sudden panic, but his limbs were pinned down too forcefully for him to have any hope of avoiding what it was to come. But the steel pipe never struck home. Just when it was about to smash into Achi's head, Susumu grabbed hold of it. The hell are you doing? Enough of this crap, Kiryu. Susumu yanked the pipe from Kiryu's grasp and tossed it onto the floor. Kiryu stood frozen in surprise, a vein pulsed angrily in his forehead. You guys too, Susumu added, glaring at the others. Let him go. The tufts holding Achi down cautiously took their hands away. Kiryu let out a red-faced cry of rage. But we got unfinished business! Ignoring him, Susumu helped Achi slide off the table. Every man gets to make one request in his life that cannot be denied. Do you remember saying that? I'm congested. <laughs> uh. It's almost as if talking four hours does that. The words stirred up some bitter memories within Archie. Yeah, yeah, I remember. But you didn't grant me my request. No, I guess not. That's why I'm going to heed yours, no questions asked. Susumu held out his right hand. Susumu, you are... That'll make me the better man. Finally. Achi reached out and clasped Susumu's hand in his. Yeah, Achi said, letting his relief show in his face. You're quite the guy. Susumu cracked a tiny grin. It was the sort of smile Achi had seen all the time back when he'd run with SOS. Suddenly, Susumu staggered and dropped to the floor, falling too fast even to cry out. Kiryu had snatched the steel pipe back from the floor, striking Susumu from behind once his back was turned. To hell with this, he howled like a madman. SOS doesn't belong to you guys. Not anymore. I won't allow it. Achi didn't flinch. SOS doesn't belong to anyone, he said. It's not mine, it's not Susumu's, and it isn't yours. We're just a bunch of friends hanging out and having a good time. That's the only reason we get together. Nothing more, nothing less. He turned and looked slowly around the room. Hey, you guys. Do you all get together because someone told you to assemble? Do you get together to follow someone's orders? No, you don't. Of course you don't. The bar fell silent. Actually, could see the young men surrounded him, exchanging glances. They could tell that his words rang true. Kiryu saw it too, and it only made him more and more agitated. Shut up! Enough with the warm fuzzies! Abruptly he charged forward, giving the steel pipe a mighty swing. And she managed to dodge the attack by a mere hair. If it had connected, the blow might well have knocked his head clean off. He quickly backed away. What's the matter? Kiryu taunted. How come all you do is run? The pipe crashed down onto the bar top. Bottles of beer and liquor smashed and scattered. Come on, what's the matter, Achi? Kiryu slammed his weapon into the pool table, sending balls scattering across the floor. Some of them collided with Susumu. 
Ugh. Susumu let out a faint groan. Smirking at the sound, Kiryu stalked toward him. Speaking of unfinished business... With a gleaming grin, Kiryu took aim at Susumu's head, lifting the pipe up high. Stop! Before he could think better of it, Achi was rushing for his fallen friend. Heh, <laughs> you dumbass. Without missing a beat, Kiryu shifted his weight and swung the steel pipe at Achi's temple. Achi responded with a fast high kick with his right leg. The steel pipe connected hard with his shin, but it was Kiryu who went reeling off balance. <laughs> I didn't get the chance to read that one. Achi pivoted and put all his might into a straight right to Kiryu's jaw. The blow struck home. Kiryu's head snapped back, and he crumpled to the floor. There was a momentary hush of indrawn breath. Then the bar erupted in a wild clamor that practically shook the whole building. All eyes were fixed on Achi, marveling at what they had just seen go down. Huh. <laughs> Sounds like folks were hoping for a little more of a fight. Susumu got to his feet, his left hand clutching his right shoulder. You alright? Achi asked. Mostly. Guess my shoulder took the brunt of the blow. The gang members from Kiryu's faction rushed to their unconscious leader's side. Achi shot them a steely glare, and they gathered up Kiryu and dragged him out of the bar. I didn't go too far here, did I? Achi asked Susumu. Is this gonna cause trouble for you? No, I figured Kiryu would pull something like this eventually. It was just a question of when. Right. I'm sure he's going to go gather up his own bunch after this. We'll probably wind up butting heads again. Susumu didn't sound especially eager for that fight, but he didn't sound especially afraid of it either. Achi was still worried about a few things, but his friend had clearly grown as a leader. Anyhow, back to that story about you needing some manpower. Will the guys here be enough? There were around 30 gang members still in the bar. Achi looked each of them in the eye in turn. Some he knew from back in the day, while others were fresh faces. I was born and raised in this town. I'm fond of the friends I've met here, and this has always been a great place to have a good time. And today, right here in this town, I met someone who's very special to me. And I know this doesn't involve the rest of you, but I'm willing to protect her. I actually knew he wasn't doing a great job of getting to the point, but the members of SOS listened quietly. And so it's like, um... He felt like a grade schooler who didn't know the answer to a difficult question. He fussed with his hair and frowned sheepishly. Okay, so I'm not sure how to really put this, but Shibuya is a special town to me because of getting to meet people like that. And maybe... No, I mean, it's like that for you guys too? Don't you love Shibuya? So help me help this town! He bowed low and deep. I want to protect this girl who means so much to me, and the city that means so much to me as well. I know my answer. Susanoo clapped a hand on Achi's shoulder. Listen up, everyone! SOS's original founder is back in action! He needs our help, and I for one am ready to follow him into battle. What do you say? Susumu's people let out a hearty cheer. When Archie marched back into his home, followed by 30 members of his old gang, Hitomi and Kano were obviously overjoyed to see him. Nay! Their happiness raised his own spirits unexpectedly high. He felt a palpable sense of accomplishment. All right, detective, Achi shouted. Let's do this! His resounding cry echoed throughout the workroom, and the gang set out for the scramble. What's the matter? Hitomi asked Archie as they made their way through the busy streets. What's the matter with what? You look pretty pale. She peered good and hard into his face. Do I now? Are you tired or something? I mean, you've kind of been going all out all day long, after all. Nah, it's nothing. Actually kept his voice nice and bright. I'm just a little hungry is all. So don't worry about me, or Alfred either, okay? I swear I'll keep you safe, Hitomi. Alright, Hitomi gave a tiny nod. Just leave it to me. Alfred's got nothing on this guy. He thumped his chest in a display of bravado, but he could feel the sweat beating on his brow.
When they reached the scramble, Archie took his place at the location specified by the battle plan Kano had drawn up. Hitomi was only a few meters away. Whatever happened, he was in a good position to shield her from harm. There were three minutes left until the appointed rendezvous. Archie wondered what sort of person was going to show up. Still, he knew he couldn't scan the crowd too much. He needed to act as naturally as possible so Alfred wouldn't be suspicious. He risked a glance over at Hitomi. Maybe now wasn't the time for admiring, but he couldn't help but think how cute she looked. In some ways, seeing her there felt similar to when he'd first seen her that morning, in the very same spot. The difference was that this time, it wasn't just Hitomi's good looks that made him find her so attractive. They might have only spent a few hours together, but in that time he'd learned a lot about her as a person. He knew what was important to her, what her worries were, her wants and desires. And also, he'd learned what a kind-hearted person she was. Archie recalled what had happened back in the workroom. Even though her own life had been in danger all day, Hitomi had shed tears for his father and his sister. She really understood people's grief and suffering. What do I do if I can't protect someone as good as her? Archie muttered under his breath, clutching his right leg. His shin was throbbing wickedly where the pipe had smashed against it. He'd been okay walking so far, but any intense fighting in the leg might just give out. But he couldn't let himself worry about that now. If it came down to it, he'd be a human shield to protect Hitomi if he had to. Achi looked at his watch. Only one minute to go before 7pm. He glanced again at Hitomi, and saw her eyes widen with surprise. Quickly, he followed her gaze across the plaza. He spotted a tall white man approaching. Keep out energy! Right, I'm gonna piss and then we'll hop back to Kano. I'm also ready to fill my body. All right, all right, all right, where was the jump? Here, right? Okay. Hachi's protests were vehement, but he backed down at last. Tatano would escort Kanan and Maria to the lab. That left three to try to apprehend Alfred. Kano, Stanley, and Archie. Having only three people was a dicey prospect though, so Archie took it upon himself to head out and gather some backup. Tatano got the car keys from Daisuke, then helped Kanan pick Maria up off the floor. Kano watched him warily. Kano did not shoot Tatano. Tatano shot the air.
There was no trace of the blood-curdling expression the older detective had shown when he was holding Maria at gunpoint. Yeah, Canaan kicked him and then he fired his gun in the air at nothing in particular while he was being kicked. His face was that of a man with responsibility, the Tatano that Kano had always known. Are you sure you're okay doing this? Hitomi asked Tatano. You might get infected. That doesn't matter. Don't worry about me. All I care about now is helping you two if I can. He hesitated, glancing down at the unconscious girl he held. By the way, have Maria's memories come back? Hitomi tilted her head. Her memories? I suspect she took a blow to the head when she was abducted. When I ran into her earlier, she didn't even know her own name. <laughs> well, she seemed like the same sister I've always known when she came in here. Good, then her memory must have recovered. Kano was shocked to hear that Maria had suffered amnesia, but it explained why she hadn't contacted anyone after she'd been set free. All right then, Tatano said. We'll be back. Carrying Maria, he and Kanan headed for the door. Detective Tatano. Kano called out, then paused, tongue-tied when Tatano stopped. I... There were so many things Kano wanted to say, but he couldn't find the words for any of them. Once Maria is safe, I'll turn myself in. Tatano kept his back turned. The words were like a dagger in Kano's heart. Once this was all over, Tatano would no longer be a detective, but a criminal. Kano knew there was no alternative, but still, the realization hit him hard. Detective Tatano, I... Stop your dithering, but... Never lose sight of what you're supposed to protect. Ever. Kano snapped back to attention at Tatano's words. That was Dick Dictum number one, the advice that had kicked off the whole Dick Diary. I'm not the one you should be worrying about right now, Tatano continued. We need to save Maria Osawa's life and protect the people of Shibuya. Kano bit his lip. Uh, decisions, decisions, man! Hey, for all of you fuckers. Yes, yes, you're right. Kano did his best to quash his emotions. Then we're good. Tatano gave a slight nod, then headed out the door. Detective Tatano! Just before the older man disappeared. <laughs> do we give him a silent salute, or do we call out one last time? The silence. Everyone loves the silent salute. Kano gave him a silent salute. It was a breach of protocol to salute while in plain clothes and without his cap. Still, it was the best way he had to let Tatano know how he felt. I'll leave the rest to you. Tatano took one last look over his shoulder before finally leaving the workroom. Hello? Eh? Some big brain shits just happened. Kyozo Tatano gingerly flexed his right elbow. It was still a little sore, but it shouldn't interfere with his ability to drive. Does that hurt? asked the girl called Kanan. No, I'm alright. Good thing I didn't kill you, she said, her tone matter of fact. You ought to thank that younger detective. If he hadn't stopped me, you wouldn't be here right now. Is that right? Tatano looked over at Kano. He was talking to Achi and the others about something. Last time Tatano had seen Achi had been back at Kotane's wake. He felt a strong surge of emotion seeing how the boy had grown into a fine young man. Are you sure you don't mind driving? Kanan's voice snapped Tatano back into the moment. Yes, it won't be a problem. Back when she'd attacked him on that rooftop, she'd moved too quickly for him to even get a glimpse of her face. Now that he was able to get a good look at her, he was shocked by how young she looked. And yet there was a cold gleam in her eyes, a glitter of awareness with no trace of emotion behind it whatsoever. 
In his long career as a detective, Tatano had seen eyes like that before. It was a look he knew well. The look of someone who had killed, and had done so many times. I'm so sorry about all this. Please look after my sister, Hitomi said. She bowed deeply. No, I'm the one who should apologize. Tatana would have liked to go on, to say that helping now was the least he could do to atone for what he'd done earlier, but he stopped himself there. Nothing he could say to Hitomi Osawa could possibly earn her forgiveness. Silently, Tatano lowered his head. His subsequent actions would have to make up for his crimes. He had to hope that this was possible. Kanan, you look after my sister too. Hitomi bowed once more. You two know each other? Tatano looked at the two girls in surprise. Kanan is my sister's friend, Hitomi said. I just met her for the first time today. What strange series of events could have transpired for Maria and Kanan to wind up as friends? Tatsuno felt a prickle of curiosity, but now was not the time for that conversation. Daisuke reappeared. He had gone to fetch his car keys. You know where it's parked, yeah? He asked. Same as back in the day? That's right. Over where we always hung out with Kotane back in grade school. All at once, Tatano was hit with a surge of childhood memories. I'm tired, dude. It's getting late. <laughs> you stream for nearly five hours, shit. The sky was a piercing blue. The droning of cicadas echoed in his ears. A refreshing breeze brought intermittent respite from the heat. During summer vacation, they spent their days here, in the parking lot behind Daisuke's house. As Tatano and Daisuke played near the stairs at the side of the lot, the blazing sun beating down on them, Kotane would always come along with some ice barley tea for them. The two boys would race to see who could drink theirs up the fastest. The cold and fragrant tea flowed down their welcoming throats. Most of the time, it was Tatano who would finish first. Daisuke often wound up choking and spitting his out. Kotane would flash him a motherly and sympathetic smile. Then Daisuke would grin back at her sheepishly and fuss with his hair. That had all been nearly 40 years ago, but Tatano could envision their smiles as vividly now as ever. They were his only fond memories of his childhood. Tatano took the keys from Daisuke, clutching them firmly in his fist. All right, he said, we'll be back. He lifted up Maria, and with Kanan supporting her on the other side, began to head for the door. Then Kano called out to him. Detective Tatano, I... There was a look of sadness on the younger man's face. Don't let yourself become a detective like me. Tatano had the words right on the tip of his tongue, but he swallowed them back down. It suddenly seemed petty to trivialize the aspirations Kano had held for so long. Once Maria is a, once Maria is a safe, once Maria is safe, I'll turn myself in. After he made sure that Maria got to the laboratory, he would cease to be a detective and instead would simply be a criminal. In Japan, a charge of plotting to commit the crime of a murder carries a prison term with a labor of not more than two years. But despite the failures that had brought him to this position, nothing he had said up until now had been a lie. Of that much, he could be proud. Never lose sight of what you're supposed to protect. Ever. He could at least try to be the detective Kano had so admired until the very end. As Tatano left the room, Kano saluted him crisply. Ordinarily, a detective wouldn't salute in plain clothes or without his cap. The little breach of etiquette just showed all the more clearly how Kano felt. If Tadano hadn't been holding Maria up, he would have returned the gesture. Leaving Endo Electronics, Tatano and Kanan carried Maria up a hectic Dogen's Arca. The parking lot was less than a minute away by foot. Before long, however, they found their way blocked by a veritable wall of people. It was a riot squad, with Kuze at the head. A police squad that carries out security and control activities in order to maintain or restore public order in the event of an emergency. The Tokyo Metropolitan Police Department has nine riot police units, along with a support vehicle unit, for a total of ten such squads. These also comprise teams that carry out certain specific functions, such as the Explosive Ordnance Division and Chemical Defense Unit. 
Director Kuze? Katano, what are you planning on doing with that girl? What are you planning on doing with her? I already informed Kano that she's to be put under quarantine. If she's allowed to remain free, all of Shibuya will be in danger. Kanan took a step forward. Katano could sense that she was about to move in for the kill. Easy now, he said softly. Wait. As skilled as Kanan was, she was no match for an entire armed police squad. I'm not going to take all of them on, she murmured. I'm just going to take the man in charge hostage. Katano swallowed. Capture Kuze and then run off? It could work. Considering the time limit they were facing, he knew that they had to find some way to force their way through here. Still, given how far they still had to go to reach the laboratory, he wanted to avoid direct conflict as much as possible. Give me one minute. No, just 30 seconds. Tatsuno turned and stared at Kuze. The two had known each other since their rookie days. Director Kuze, tell me. What is it that you believe in? What do I believe in? Yes. Weren't you always the one who said that you needed to put your faith in your subordinates no matter what? Well, yes, yes, that's right. Kuze's eyes wavered ever so slightly. In that case, put your faith in me. No, put your faith in Kano. In Kano? He believes that saving Maria Osawa will let us save Shibuya. He's doing everything he can to make that happen. Kuze's lips curled into a wry grin. That sounds like Kano, all right. Always thinking in such simple terms. Usually, the simple answer is the right one, sir. People like you and me overthink things. We make them more complicated than they need to be. Just consider for a moment. Will putting Maria Osawa under quarantine clear up this case? No, it won't. So long as we don't know how she was infected with the virus, we can't rule out the possibility that other people have been infected as well. Tatano kept his eyes locked on Kuze's. Director Kuze, right now what we need to do more than anything is get our hands on that antiviral drug. We need to be helping Kano. Please, sir. Kuze furrowed his brow in thought for a few moments, then shook his head. Tatano, buddy, come on. I can't do that. You gotta understand the position I'm in. The director's voice squeaked into his childish register. Kano narrowed her eyes. What's this guy's deal? She whispered. It's, well, it's hard to explain, but when his voice gets like that, it means... <laughs> the chat says B! He was confused. Now was their chance to make a run for it. Tatano signaled with his eyes to Kanan, then got ready to sprint past Kuze and his team. He didn't get the chance to, though. Ugh. Suddenly, Kuze let out a pained yelp. Then, as Tatano watched in surprise, he proceeded to collapse onto the pavement. Ah! It hurts! It hurts! Have I been infected with the virus too? The riot squad immediately rushed to the director's side. As Tatano stood there, dumbstruck, Kuze secretively flashed him a knowing wink. That was a terrible performance, Kanan muttered. Yeah, but it was a tour de force as far as I'm concerned. Inwardly, Tatano gave his boss a nod of respect. Slipping past the riot squad, he and Kanan headed for the parking lot. Several members of Kuze's team hurried to chase after them. Don't follow them, Kuze cried out as he arrived on the ground. Everyone stay back! If you get too close to Maria Osawa, you'll be infected as well! The riot squad stopped in their tracks. Tatano and Kanan took the opportunity to hurry out of sight. Darting through some narrow alleyways, they arrived at the parking lot. The area had changed since Tatano's youth, but some of the old air of nostalgia still lingered. There it is! He spotted the minivan with Endo Electronics written on the side. Tatano gently laid Maria on the back seat. She was still apparently unconscious. Once Kanana climbed into the passenger seat, Tatano hit the gas and sped off. How far is it to the lab? Kanan asked. Normally it would take about 15 minutes, but with this traffic, it's hard to say. Tatano avoided the stop and go of Dogenzaka, taking side streets as he headed toward Shibuya Station. Once they had re-emerged on the main thoroughfare, though, he spotted a checkpoint set up ahead. 
Barricades and armoured vehicles were blocking the road. The scale of the security effort showed just how grave the situation truly was. Tatano hit the brakes. What do we do? Kanan spoke without taking her eyes off the barricade ahead. Tatano thought for a few moments before arriving at an answer. Make choice while Punchy pees out. <laughs> They'd have to plow on through. Get in the back seat, Tatano told Kanan. Why? I want you to hold onto Maria so she doesn't fall. A feisty grin came to Kanan's face. You got it. Kanan quickly clambered into the back, and Tatano gunned the accelerator. It's do or die now. Tatano clenched his teeth as the van picked up speed. Then a patrol car came roaring out of a nearby side road. What the- Reflexively, Tatano eased up on the gas. The police cruiser cut in front of the minivan, turning to head right toward the roadblock. Crashing into the barricade, it plowed on through, not stopping until it slewed up onto the curb beyond. The car's impact made enough space for another vehicle to slip through in its wake. Alright, here goes! The minivan barreled on through the checkpoint. Tatano wondered who in the world had been driving the cruiser. Tatano's phone rang and he picked up as he sped onward. Were you... able to break through safely? It was the voice of Detective Kajiwara. Tatano had thought he was at the Osawa residence. That patrol car just now. That was you? A call came in from Task Force HQ, saying that Kano had found Maria. I figured maybe Kano was planning to take her to Akoshi Pharmaceutical, and so I thought he'd need to make his way through one of the checkpoints here. But the fact that it was you, Detective Tatano, <laughs> now that was quite unexpected. He let out a weak chuckle. Kajiwara, are you hurt? No, don't worry about me. Just please help Maria. I, I made a promise to her father that I'd save his daughter, no matter what. Tatano could hear the energy draining from Kajiwara's voice. Understood. I'll keep that promise for you then. Thank you. The line went dead. He crashed headlong through that barricade. There was no way he'd come out of that uninjured. I'm sorry, Kajiwara. Tatano said to himself under his breath. And thank you. He bit his lip and stepped hard on the gas again. Keep out! Keep out! Oh, oh, oh. Kano, uh, I... Can we select... We can select Tatano from the... We have a main image now. Incredible. A smidgen more Kano, you say? Why a smidgen more, precisely? Like, three pages. Why is Minnow still there? Because Minnow has an ending in this block. Okay, I'll trust you on this one, Kenzie. But seriously, I don't have time for much more. I'll leave the rest to you. 
Tatano took one last look over his shoulder before finally leaving the workroom. Even after Tatano disappeared from view, Kano remained for a long time at attention, his fingertips pressed to his temple. He squeezed his eyes shut, but still the tears he'd been holding back poured down his cheeks. Yeah, because I gotta say, I'm running out of time just sort of in the day, and also, I've been going for five hours, my voice wants to die. There were only 30 minutes remaining until the time when Alfred had told them Hitomi should be at the scramble. They needed to get ready for action. Is the surveillance camera system still up? Kano asked. Yes, Daisuke replied. It looks like what happened earlier was just a temporary hacking job. Then will you help us? Daisuke inclined his head. What do you mean? I'd like you to keep your eye on the scramble for us. If anyone suspicious tries to get near Hitomi, let us know. Anyone suspicious? How will I know what's suspicious? Like that organ trafficker who suggested you kept up Hitomi, Mr. Endo. It's possible that he might be Alfred. Would you be able to recognize his face? Daisuke furrowed his brow deeply as he began entering commands on his keyboard. Yeah, don't think I could ever forget. It's because of him that I... He left the rest unsaid. A moment later, several of the monitors switched over to feeds from around the scramble. Alright, Daisuke squinted at the images. I'm not sure how much help I can be, but let me at least try to atone for what I've done. Of course, and thank you. Daisuke's fingers flew over the keyboard, and soon all of the monitors were focused on the scramble and its surroundings. Then he carefully adjusted the angle and zoom for each of the cameras. Now the whole area was under total surveillance. All they had to do was get their stakeout crew to the scene. Where did Achi go? Kano asked Hitomi. I'm not totally sure, but I think he went to find some of his old friends. Hitomi sounded worried. Friends? Achi used to belong to a gang called SOS. Actually, he told me he was the one who formed the gang in the first place. What? Kano couldn't keep the shock from his voice. Achi was the founder of SOS? How bizarre that the two of them would end up meeting this way. But I guess there was a big falling out between them, so I think he went to try and win them back over. Kano hadn't heard anything good about SOS since Archie had left them. If things had ended on bad terms between him and the gang, getting them to help might well be a lost cause. Even if Archie was able to gather some people up, how much would Kano and the others be able to trust them? It'll be alright, Hitomi said, as if sensing Kano's thoughts. I'm sure Archie will bring back some of his old friends, and when he does bring them, I'm sure he'll choose people we can count on. You really trust him, don't you? Yes, Hitomi said without hesitation. Then a blush came to her cheeks. Alright, then I'll trust him too. It would take about ten minutes to get from Endo Electronics to the scramble. Kano turned to Stanley. Let's plan to head out by 6.50. Stanley gave no reply. He had withdrawn to the edge of the room, where he stood lost in thought, his expression uneasy. Kano decided to leave him alone for a bit. Taking a sheet of paper from one of the desks, he began drafting a plan for positioning Achi's reinforcements around the scramble. Alright, there we go. In about five minutes, he had drawn up a little map of the optimal places to deploy the team. It included positions for as many as 20 people Achi might bring back. Kano. Hey, Farnin. We're, like, right at the end of this fucking 40-hour long game. I'm not gonna finish it tonight, but I'm getting pretty close. Too much. Too much left. Kano turned around, surprised to find Stanley right behind him all of a sudden. The American looked haggard. Is something the matter? Kano asked. You need to go to the scramble without me. What? Where's this coming from all of a sudden? Please, don't ask me to explain. Something else has come up, and I have to see to it. Sweat beaded on Stanley's brow. Whatever had happened, Kano had no doubt it was something major. Almost certainly, it had something to do with Alfred. Stanley, Kano said. But what is the choice? <laughs> we have bees in the chat. I understand. Do what you have to and come back soon. I'm sorry, I wish I could tell you more. It's alright, I'll find a way to get by. Kano had a vague idea of what Stanley was up to. 
He probably felt he needed to keep things hidden, even from his own allies, in order to keep help keep Alfred in the dark. I'm not reading this well. Or at least, that was Kano's guess. This was no ordinary opponent they were up against. Keeping secrets even among friends wasn't necessarily a bad call. Kano, promise me one thing. What's that? Once this is all over, you'll go have a beer with me. Sure. Alright. Kano couldn't help but smile. That's a promise now, remember. The promise these two made just now mirrors another made by a certain pair of brothers in the past. Once this is all tidied up, I'm gonna need a drink. Let you and me have a beer together. That was what the younger brother said, and the older brother still feels the pain of that promise going unfulfilled. What? I think that's all I've got time for. It did it did save, by the way, like when I did that, right? Did it, the, game, the game saved, didn't it? I'm pretty, pretty sure it saved. Did it save? Where's the save the icon? Yeah, there's the, okay, good. Dunzo! And about precisely five hours to finish this stream off. I'm a hit, back to fucking title screen. That's all I got time for today, man. It's been five hours of streaming this shit. And we're actually still three bad endings short, so like, can we like die more? Like just a few more? Just just a few more. What a place to end off on today, though. Fucking, there's two jumps with to, to, to new character. What? A, oh, they save such a thing for the final. For the final, they, they you don't even you don't even think it's such a thing. They don't even know. You don't even think it's a thing, but it's a thing. It's like that. It'd be like that. It's like, what? That's crazy. <laughs>